Hello everyone. Happy New Year. Well, Happy New Year's Eve. How are we all doing? And Happy New Year to those. Good God, those that's going um, high. So I've been having fun with XSplit recently, not a pick making me sound as quiet as anything. And now it appears to be on a reverse kick and going, I'm going to make you sound as loud as anything. Oh, that's nice. That's back to normal then. That I can deal with. That I know how to fix. Being quiet, I do not understand, and I do not know how to fix. How are you all doing today? Yes, this is the appropriate attire, I'm told. <coughs> it's my... One well, of my newer Christmas shirts, actually. The mighty... Uh, the mighty... Well, let's be honest. If they have antlers at this time of year, the mighty lady deer. Because... That's the point. But this time of year, deers do not have antlers. Right then, hello, John Shea. Hello, Alazaski. Hello, William Bolton. Happy New Year to everyone. Happy New Year. Um, I'm going to move this to... That was less than I uh, less than I was hoping for, but you know. There you go. Christmas tree archive. So it's safe from the flailing hands. <sighs> Also, let's make it a little bit lighter. All uh, right. <laughs> this is how the cool, spend, uh, cool kids spend ho hog money. Yes, it is how the cool kids spend hog money. That's just a tad better, isn't it? That is a tad more human and less. Zuckerberg shouting infidels. Okay. Uh, let's just check where that goes. Should I be worried? Um, someone appears to be talking about setting up an inquisition. I'm, I'm slightly worried about this one now. Is Melanie here? Well, hello, Sean Mac. Hello, Jane of Hello DGV for of uh, forty. Um, hello, DM Carpenter. Hello, Thomas Malski. Hello. Felix B, hello. Paul Ketchum, hello. <laughs> hello, Captain Seafort. Hello. I'm not sure if I've seen you before. Hello, Melanie1640. Hello, HMS Ford. Happy amateur night. <laughs> hello, Adam Crow. Eric Akin. Hello. In, uh, Aviator Enterprise. Hello. Just finished DJ Holmes' book one in Empire Rising. Couldn't put it down. Thanks for turning me on to this fantastic series. It is a lovely series. Apparently then we disconnected from chat and then reconnected to chat. Not sure when that happened. Um, I do know that's now gone to 01 minute 4, 19 down on the time. So, so God knows what happened to the time. Isn't it? <laughs> Hello everyone. I am not sure why that went to loading. I do honestly not know. Hello. Uh, um Michael Rose. Hello, Alex Jacobs. Hello, Gordon Collins. Hello, Stafford Thompson. Hello. Pepin Tor. Hello. Matt Day. Hello. Happy New Year to everyone who's in New Year and Happy New Year's Eve to people who are still in New Year's Eve. Hello, Rooksfoot. Hello, constant drowsiness. Now, um, I have no idea about that little sort of figure boom, what happened. Um, I'm really not sure. It says high CPU usage, but I'm not really sure what's making use of so much CPU usage. Oh, right then. 
So, as you can see, I have my lovely tank card here. And, well, one can. It's not full though yet, is it? This is the supplies I went to get. Very important, the ice cold supplies from the place where it is ice cold in our garage. Makes life very nice. Hello, Stefan Pajang. A not full tank card. Nope. Now, just about right. Mm -hmm. Hello, Crobo79. So, and Juicy Susan. Hello. No, you're not late at all. Is this going to be from your dissertation? It is from my PhD thesis, yes. It is from my PhD thesis. Some of it. Honestly, some of it's not, because, how do I put this? My PhD thesis was including appendices and everything else, 130,000 words in total. And still, to get on with word count, I had to delete an entire section. Now, for those who don't know, my PhD was structured into roughly five sec uh, six sections, each with three chapters. The PhD which is submitted was four sections, each with roughly three chapters. And came in at roughly 100,000 words in written text. And so there are two whole sections that disappeared from it. And one of those sections included a whole lot of stuff about the origins of naval aviation. And one of those sections included a whole lot of stuff comparing the British progress and British, report, uh, British development to the American and Japanese and why they differed. Uh, so basically, this presentation is those two sections, <laughs> which never made it into the PhD thesis. Hello, our uh, happy New Year, RA4. New Year's? Yeah. James Carter, I've arrived all the time. <laughs> Excellent. Truco1388, uh, hello. Peter Dawson, if it's ice cold here, is there an aircraft carrier? HMS? There as well. <laughs> Are we starting with turret top launch planes? Well, we will be looking at those, yes. Shumi, hello. And Shane F, hello. <laughs> you have uh, Shane F. Have, and thank you, Doctor, for helping me keep my sanity as I start a retirement. Uh, Josie on 130 words on a thousand words. I thought a 20 page college term paper was a venture. Uh, the book which I've written is 85,000 words and growing as we edit it. So, the first book, it, 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 it basically, the editor sent it back to me. It's got a whole lot of words cut and they've got the questions going. Uh, can you uh, can you explain this bit? Can you explain this bit? And I sort of get some. I sometimes do go to them. Uh, the bit you've cut is what explains it. Oh, we thought that was extraneous words. No, let me rewrite it. Imperator Fraun, hello. I expect you to be coming back soon as the big bag in uh, bad in Star Wars. Basically, a Thanos, but with actual credibility. Because I have to say, that was the big disappointment in Marvel. It was they spent years building up to this big bad, and then when Thanos appears, all he wants to do is be a farmer. And anyone who read the comics knew that, really. So it was a kind of case of, this guy wants to be... Yes, he wants to do that, but all he wants to do is he wants to be a farmer. Basically, he's the galaxy's biggest eco-terrorist. How environmentally friendly is that? 
Hello, Jess B. <laughs> so, first of all, Happy New Year to the lovely Cl uh, Anne and Louise and Eric who are watching, and all the cousins, and my mum and sister, Christine and Karen. Hello. And by the way, my mum's currently running a little get a little thing. Um, she's wondering if any anyone's going to find her on Twitter now. For this rule, I'm not allowed to admit, uh, tell you what her name is on Twitter or anything about it, but I am allowed to give one clue, which is I'm one of three people she follows and she never retweets me. She's currently running a bet because she, because the reason is, is because between her and my sister, because my sister has a Twitter account, but doesn't want anyone to follow her. And is really worried that people will find her if they find me. And mum went, well, they haven't even found me and they won't, they won't probably take any notice of me. So they'll never find you. So there's a little competition going between the two. Oh. Happy New Year, James Carter. <laughs> Monday, sixteen forty. Standing on the brakes in full ABS engagement. Eighteen inches clearance. Wow! It sounds like you had a fun day. A woman in SUV talking on her cell phone pulled out in front of me, going at about one hundred and ten kilometers an hour. So I'm guessing from the mixture of metric and linguistics. Canada, and having met many Canadians in the year, over the years, I have to admit, my average opinion is they are some of the nicest people in the world, but on once put them behind a car, and they become practically Finnish, in that they all seem to have lead foots. <laughs> so this is the challenge to find your mother. <laughs> this is her challenge, not mine. <sighs> yeah, she saw that and she said, "I am, uh, you know, that that's the maximum uh, maximum information I'm allowed to give out." <laughs> In America, they ever enforce the speed limits? <laughs> Thomas care to correct that. <laughs> oh. You may now eat, if you're Canadian, you may now eat a sandwich. Mm. It could just be the fact that most of the Canadians I met are my relatives. But as I said, my impression of the Canadians is they are incredibly nice people up until they're put behind a, the steering wheel of a car, in which case they get lead feet and mild road rage. <laughs> All right, then. So. Aircraft carriers of the 1920s and 1930s. And it seems an appropriate thing to talk about on this new year because, as it happens almost every single year at this time, people are starting to worry and wonder about the future. And when they're talking about the future, they tend to start talking about the future of aircraft carriers when it comes to navies and go, oh, they'll be gone soon. Here is the small problem. And it comes back to their original creation. Why do you want naval aviation? Well, it starts with light and air. It starts with the Mayfly. That thing. 
Yes, you can all agree with me. That does look very mayfly-like, which are these light, buzzy little insects, and that looks so light and small. Yeah, reversing out of what looks like a, something which could have been in Chatham Dockyard. If you ever go to Chatham Dockyard, you will see huge structures, which basically... The, you find that quickly, very quickly, the Navy's methodology of building a hall on the uh, uh, or hall or any kind of covering on land is basically go, what do we know how to build? A hull. We will build a hull upside down. That is why these buildings have keels. You go to any of them, you can work out very quickly. You start going, that, that, that there's framing, there's a keel. You know, I always remember taking my dad when I was about seven or eight around Chatham Dockyards. It must have been the first time I went. And we we're all sort of looking up. And my mum was going, don't you dare say it, Douglas. Don't you say it. There are other people watching. But there's this person talking, uh, this person in the guy going, this is a beautiful hall, da, 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 da. And he wasn't one of the regular tour guides. It was a school trip, I, I reckon. From somewhere and going, how it's built. In it. And eventually, my mom just went, oh, just do it. And my dad launches and going, excuse me, but I think you're missing the point here. This is the ship we're in. If you look at this point, this point, this point, this point. Because the guy had been giving basically bad information for about 10 minutes. And... My mom was just watching my dad turn more and more, going, mm -mm, mm -mm, There is bad information being delivered here. I have to correct this somehow. And she basically held on to him for as long as it could, and then she let him go. But she also then evacuated me and my sister <laughs> quickly from the room. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like, oh, man. Uh, the speed limit is a suggestion in some parts of the USA, but not all. Okay. <laughs> uh, Four say one survived about as long as May flight. Yes, it did. I literally just two months ago got a, go, got a car again for the first time since January 2017. I've been riding a Suzuki Bergman 400 from then until two months ago. Mom got worried about my safety and said, you're getting a car. I would have been dead yesterday if I'd still been on a motorcycle. I would have to agree. Although, there again. I drive a Subaru Impreza, which is... um From experience? Uh, Pretty close to a motorcycle in certain handling characteristics. I'm kind of, I'm just going through a whole bunch of pictures of Chatham Yard. Looks like a really interesting place to visit. Yes. Hmm. Inca upside down boats as sheds at the sea houses, Northumberland. Ooh, yep. There are lots of them around the UK. Hi, Carl Harmon. Oh, familiar issue. It's like uh, from time to time. It's like holding on to uh, the fifteen-inch guns while they are correcting slowly, and then it comes. Yeah, William, on. you're talk taking your dad. A son around chat and right. I think he might have mistaken what he was taking. Well, <sighs> you know, I was the one who basically instigated we were going and kept uh, nagging for it. My poor sister, who was in doing her GCSEs at the time, was um, less amused. I think she was hoping for a summer off of peace. And instead, we were at Chatham Dockyard. Oh. Hello, her full name.
Hmm. You're in ah, North of Orlando, Florida. Well, A, I congratulate you on your, incre on your correct use of, me of metric. Uh, that's not putting the Americans down. I, I, lo I love the fact that uh, sometimes I'm in a room with American and Europeans, and because of the joy of the British educational system, we get taught imperial and metric. And I'm literally the translator in the room, because most of the Americans are talking in imperial. Although they probably don't call it imperial, but it is imperial. And <laughs> the Europeans are talking <laughs> in metric, and there's me, the historian in the room, sitting there going, So I'm the mathematical I'm the mathematical translator here going on. Hello, old Richard. We call that standard measure, William. Ah, yes. <laughs> Hello, Paul. <laughs> right. So, basically, the whole reason naval aviation starts off is because they want to do reconnaissance. That is what aircraft are for. They're reconnaissance assets. They're the commanders trying to get a bird's eye view. Preferably without having to go themselves, because they've seen how what these things look like. None, none of the admirals are really keen on getting them. There is a paper in, I think, about 1915, which suggests admirals should command their fleets from airships. And I'm not sure what happens to the person who wrote this paper, but I'm fairly sure either Beatty or Jellico had them quietly done away with. All I know is they write this paper and then they disappear from the Navy. <laughs> Jennifer, having seen the cover docket chat many times, I have to agree with your father. I personally believe it's the largest one in the whole I've viewed. <laughs> yep. How many ounces in a pint? Oh. That depends. It really does depend sometimes. Imperial ounces are different. There is. Well, let me check what the American one is. Usually I have to look up the American one of ounces in a pint, I have to admit. That's not usually where it comes in. It's usually um, things like measurements from feet to inch, uh, from inches to meters, and, that, and that's because of conversion. I think it's 16, though. But I do know somewhere else which... To uh, I think, well, that's what I usually go with. 16 in the UK. 20 in Imperial, though. Or is that where we're around? One or the other. And... <laughs> Melanie, I can't stand Imperial. <laughs> Don't sign up. Wait, BT in an airship? With his super duper... <laughs> Single communication, that would have gone great. We would be speaking German and eating sauerkraut. <laughs> Actually, think of it this way. If BT had been in an airship, that would mean Thomas would have been in charge. And of the ships on the, on the surface. So with BT, with his bad communications, he would have been completely out the freaking loop. And so it would have been Thomas communicating with Jellicoe. So I think Jellico missed the trick. I think BT should be put in a freaking airship. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Seth Thompson, I have the feeling they were sent to Scarpa Flow, a Scarpa or a uh, Faroe uh, Faro Islands for that one. Ah. Scarpa was where the Grand Fleet was based. <laughs> I'm not sure if being in that closer proximity to Jellico would have been safe for him. Oh. Right. And the aircraft developed from there. And they developed quite quickly because you have this coming out, and really, it's coming out quite quickly. And then you have these start to happen. 
And you have the Yanks get involved. It's always nice when the Americans jump in and they annoy the Brits by doing something first. Usually the British like to do things first. You know, first angled flight deck, first signal, mirror, uh, signal, uh, sort of mirror um, landing. These sort of things that the British, uh, the British do like to do the first in naval aviation just to wind up our basically the troll the U.S. Navy. And but this starts early with the USN trolling the British, and it's Eugene Burton flying off the USS Birmingham, which was scout cruiser number two in Hampton Roads, Virginia. And that was a nice little flight. As you can see, the aircraft is interesting. Personally, if you had shown me this aircraft and told me to take it for a flight, especially off a ship with that higher bow, in fact, I think that bow might be the model that they based the Imperium um warships on from warhammer 40k just look doesn't that look like some uh, one of those you know the big dreadnoughts you know bow from the imperium it, it it does um and they even got a plane guard which is nice they have a destroyer sitting back there as plane guard what it can do from over there quickly i do not know um, but it's there. And then a very short time later, well, literally two years in 1912, HMS Hibernia is on the way. She's a very nice ship. She's picked specifically to allow this to take place, and you have an equally frail-looking aircraft taking off, which actually has flotation bags on it. Airbag floats to enable the land on the water. That is how much, how heavy these aircraft weigh, that simply attaching airbags onto its wheels is enough to allow it to land on water. And also, 16 in the US, 20 in the UK. Hmm? I'm interested in is how big one ton? <laughs> 2,000 pounds in the US, 240 in the UK. Oh, it gets really, really fun. We'll be getting into that at one point today. Eric Alvin, good afternoon. Don't oh, worry. Did I miss something? Uh, some um, Just miss ways of getting rid of BT. Do you know what I want? Well, potentially. Potentially, there's a way of getting rid of BT. Or at least shutting him up. Culture House, could check the crew list of the Shackleton expedition. <laughs> that might be far enough. Uh, I didn't think being posted in New Zealand would be far enough, because I think Jellico ends up as governor out there at one point. JSL, what's the purpose of barrage balloons? Basically, barrage balloons are floating obstacles for aircraft. Either the wires will damage your wings, or you might fly into them yourself. It's basically, how to put it, barrage balloons are an attempt to almost create a sort of minefield. You've got to remember the sort of military mindset that has been dealing with things. And honestly... It's going to sound strange, but you, mm, the trouble is with modern standoff weapons, the idea is sort of removed. But there is part of me which still thinks if you've got low-flying, skimming weapon systems, having a net hanging in midair from barrage balloons might be an interesting idea. I would just fly into the net and go, there. And shape. Metric is always better, because I wouldn't have to deal with decimal points like in inches. Ah, uh, yes. The question is, does 4.7 inch really make 120 millimeters?
Living Cox, the advantage you really applied to ships because they're big enough to provide room for the early sets, plus the power required for them. I think the Zeppelin and Lushov had radios early, but they were undependable. Oh, yes. But this is the other advantage. Put BT in an airship. Now, I've never thought of this before, but I think that's been a really good thing. They actually developed a, a lot of technology specific for airships in Germany. I'm writing a short piece on the his, uh, history of Telefon. Set up by army scientists. Because high use building. Cool. Hello, Tian Wang, otherwise known as Golden Eagle. Tom, I see an image of very angry bait to us pointing at the guy opera, opera, operating the roping, sh uh, shouting, faster, faster, <laughs> who knows? Uh, Trek of putting in. Well, Lion almost sank a dog bank and almost blew up a John. Two easy ways to get rid of BT. Plus, there was Scarborough. Mm. Melee 1640. But Dr. Glock, attaching airbags is how US and Iowa floats. The airbags just made of sometimes 495mm thick armor plate. Mm. Anyway. So. There is a lot of work, and then it all comes to HMS Furious. Now, here's the thing. I am going to blame this quite sincerely on HMS Furious because most of the issues we have with modern aviation and modern naval aviation, I say, go back to the fault of HMS Furious. And there is a very simple reason for this. She can not only conduct the first airstrike, but also the um, second, well, the first deck landings. Of a cat on a carrier, and the first air accident, which kills a pilot. So basically, she shows the potential and the risks, and they still build them. So it's obviously her fault. And this is where we get into the point, and one of the reasons why I said at the beginning there is a whole lot of point of the future of naval aviation. Why are they doing this? Why aren't they developing aircraft carriers when, theoretically, you could just keep deliver uh, building bigger and bigger airships or bigger and better aircraft if a floating bomb doesn't attract your attention? Why do you keep doing and building this? Well, there's two reasons. One, flying over long distances. It's great for a strike mission. But it's navigationally difficult, especially pre-GPS, and it's boring, and it's labor-intensive. And secondly, you fly that long way to engage the target, and then you have to come back to rearm and refuel. And yes, you can do refueling in the air. It's perfectly viable. But the tankers have to launch somewhere, and you still can't rearm in the air. Until we have, I don't know, some form of laser or something which can move out in the aircraft. And even then, they would still need to be rearmed, probably. And the odds are they're also going to need to be maintained. And aircraft do require a lot of maintenance. So. Thank you, Night Heron Productions. That's very kind of you. As I often say. It's very kind, whatever anyone gives. But the whole point is, the aircraft carrier is not just your mobile aerodrome, although it is. It is your mobile logistics store. It is your mobile command center. It is your mobile accommodations. It is your mobile everything for operational operations. This is what your aircraft carrier provides you with. It's not... The whole thing about people when they go, Oh, aircraft carriers are obsolete. Well, why are they obsolete? Do you suddenly not need to rearm your aircraft? 
is it going to make them more difficult to operate? Could they not be the only capital ship we have in service? Well, I would argue they aren't the only capital ship we have in service and haven't been. Uh, it's one of the interesting things is that since the battleship went, it's been viewed that the aircraft carrier is the only capital ship in service. But people forget that when the battleship and the aircraft carrier in the 1920s and 1930s, especially in the 1930s, were in service, they were both capital ships. And there was battle cruisers. Since World War II, there has been an explosion in amphibious warfare capabilities, in specialist ships built for amphibious warfare, in bigger, more powerful amphibious ships. Why? Because the capital ship, its role is to project power. Fight battles and project power. Now, the thing is, you've got your aircraft carrier and you've got your amphibious ships. They both project power. I struggle when people start defining a ballistic missile submarine or even an SSN as a capital ship. And I have two reasons for that. One, your ballistic missile submarine probably can qualify as a capital ship. But the thing is, it's not going to, it's projecting power as long as you have it out the sea. It's a capability projection rather than a ship which is actually projecting it because you don't want people to know where that ship is because then that makes it numero uno targeto. And that's just not good for anyone. As for the SSN, again, if it's a stealth battle, it's not there to project. It's, it, it is there as your, it is a capability projection rather than the ship that's projecting. So, hmm. but this brings me back to my point. We keep saying, okay, the aircraft carrier could be over as coverage. I don't see the capability to rearm and repair aircraft and maintain aircraft and within tactical distance of operations going away, going away as something which is needed. I also see the point of Battlestar Galactica. That's the thing. A slightly more heavily armed aircraft carrier, quite possibly. But no, the aircraft carrier is not going to be going away anytime soon. When I think the aircraft carrier does go away is when we have fighters based on spaceships that can drop down from space anywhere into the uh, into Earth orbit. But that's a whole level of technology. And as someone has written already here, and I'll be going through the comments in a second, battleships weren't obsolete. They were just not as cost effective as aircraft carriers and people can afford to maintain both. All right, then. Mm hmm. Force A1. In the 1980s, a system called Rampart was developed, was proposed, which would rapidly deploy barrage balloons, smoke screens, chaffer, and infrared decoys to deal low flying aircraft and weapons. Ooh, sounds fun. Tian Wang. Oh, Drax's idea is to have him replace Bernie before Jutland. Uh, and what, what justification he has for his assignment when he didn't know the night action of the Battle of Jutland will take place? Get rid of them. That's the point. Juno Wano. Isn't this the same HMS Furious conversion? Yes, it is. HMS Furious gets slowly converted into a full-length carrier. That's why we're we'll talking to her at some points. This is the point at which she's in a partial carrier. Anomus, that boat had anger issues. Most of them did. So, I, I got on my forum a ways to get rid of BT without having Hipper and BT's respective airships just ram it out. Imagine that sight. Ooh. That would be fun to watch. And also, refueling in the air is in 1920s. Yeah. But it takes a while to get a reliable system that's safe. Peter Dawson. Curious Spurious and Outrageous were the nickname of the Free British Aircraft Carriers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, I don't know. Someone's got Vader's face. Hello, Rick Vasa. I'm now using your comment, Rick, to make sure I mean to, I, I spot a place. Hello. There you go. <laughs> Also, when people who say aircraft carries obsolete seem to think that vulnerability equals obsolescence and fail to understand that everything in some way is vulnerable. Pretty much. Aircraft carriers are vulnerable. So what? It's new. In the nicest way, a fair number of them got sunk in World War II because they were vulnerable, not because they were suddenly invulnerable. Anonymous, submarines will launch 40 uh, aircraft strikes of drones. I doubt it, because again, if you're talking a submarine carrying drones, AK, to carry enough, A, it's going to be, have to be a big submarine, in which case that's going to be difficult to get close. How much operating time are those drones going to have? How are they going to be packaged to get through the salt water to get a... Uh, oh, and the moment you start launching drones from a position, you're going to have to move, otherwise your submarine's found. Mita Dawson, could you rearm McDonald F-85? Goblin. Uh, hmm. Not sure. <laughs> Eric Kaufman, kinetic bombardment. Hmm, that'll be fun. Gary Selsky, the only point at which rail battleships come back is if rail guns with 400 kilometers range smart projectiles become practical. Do battleships come back or do a new generation of cruisers get built? Or do they get called super destroyers because no one can call something a cruiser or a battleship anymore because that sounds imperial. And like we're building an empire. Hmm. William Cox, I love battleships, but we need to answer the gun versus missile argument definitively first. Why do you think we're ever going to answer that question? <laughs> I have a feeling missiles are here to stay in terms of an autonomous projectile which commits suicide uh, with an explosive uh, inside any uh, in, in, inside your opponent. And I have a feeling guns are going to be here to stay because guns tend to be cheaper than that. Also, no, no brew for any yeah, yeah, that's terrible. And could the idea of flying aircraft carriers akin to Akron and Macron or Macron? Uh, probably not. Um, th. There seems to be something weird going on there. I'm not sure. TH, you've got... Do you hate Asians or Japanese people? No, I don't think. No. Quite like Chinese food. Some very cool friends were Japanese. Including one who recently got married, so I presume she's not watching tonight. But if she is, congratulations. Four say one. Oh, um, HMS Ben My Cherie being sunk by Toji Kirk Artillery in 1917 conclusively proves that all aircraft carriers are obsolete. <laughs> but actually, Calm Gasm, Battleship and Vulnerability, as poor Shanhorse demonstrated, one cannot arm a radar, and without radar, your battleship is but a target. It is at night. Can I see for? Do you think a useful way to differentiate between sub SN and SBN and surface capital ships would be between projecting power alone, former, and presence, latter? Yes. So if you're basically going for it, and I, as I said, the SSNs I don't really see as a capital ship. They have some capabilities, but they're not capital ships. But that doesn't make it wrong. 
There's this idea that every ship has to be a capital ship or it doesn't matter. It's like, I see the whole point of the destroyer. People keep talking about destroyers. And yes, I, I must admit myself for the Type 45s, I'd love them to be fitted with the Mark 41 VLS. And some Tomahawks would be nice most of the time. But in wartime, what I'd like them to have is the Mark 41 VLS and the SM-3 anti-ballistic missile radar, uh, anti-ballistic missile system. Why? Because I think if you're going against a power which may or may not have anti-ship ballistic missiles, it helps to have the best working system we currently have. There are lots of systems which look better on paper, I have to admit that. And maybe in a decade or two decades or three decades, it'll actually become reality. But at the moment, the one we have that works, that we know works and is available, and that you can man on ship, requires the Mark 41 VLS and is called the SM-3. So that's what I like the Royal Navy's uh, Type 45s to have the Mark 41 VLS. Type 26s are getting Tomahawks. Lovely. They're anti submarine warfare frigates. You're giving them a cruise missile strike capability because that improves your initial strike for your task group. Fine. Mice well, you can bolt them on, you've got the spare hull space. It isn't going to interfere in what they're doing, and they're not exactly your primary air defense asset. Same with Type 31s, if they have it. That's great. Type 45s, as I said, they are a primary air defense asset. There is nothing wrong with being an air defense ship. Not every ship has to be a capital ship. Troco 1388. Any good books on IGN Caravan? I haven't found any. That'll that's a good starting point. Mark Stiles book. Um Kamikaze is far more about the war. There are a few other books. I think I've done a whole episode on Japanese on the Japanese Navy or something. Either brew ships or um, four random books. <laughs> Avian Empress, I wonder if naming conventions for current submarines causes some confusion since their namesake predecessors were capital ships. I think that's the problem. We're naming them for capital ships and they're not really capital ships. You said both SB and SB and S and weren't capital ships. Wouldn't that be obvious SB and weren't? Well, the point is, as I said, the SSBNs are a capital ship capability in that you're a st they're a strategic deterrent power projection, but you are not going to float your SSBN up somewhere to actually act as a capital ship and go, we're here. You can see me. I can see you. So they are the capital ship in terms of capability, but they aren't the capital ship in terms of operational ability. Um, Michael Rose, don't the SM3 also have a second anti-ship weapon, or am I thinking of SM6? I think both can be used for that. That's a good chat going on this evening. Thomas Vano, no one wants to do re reactors like the Russians. Rick Vassar, is there any offense against hypersonic missiles? Well, so far, brew ships and bilge, oh no, bilge pumps has theorized basically two defenses have gone through. 
There's potential, of course, for your own hypersonic missiles. There's potential of rail guns eventually in time coming in. Or, using current technologies, there is chaff and various other laws you can use in terms of sensitive decoys. There is putting up flak, a nice wall of flak, a 40 millimeter far, probably, uh, in the right place. Because let's be honest, hypersonics are very fast, but they can't maneuver that well at that high speed. Even the slightest deviation is going to send you a long way off course. That can mean you don't hit your target. And potentially, there is, of course, laser based weaponry, which we are all working towards, and different people claim is capable, and others don't claim it's capable. And that would, of course, work by heating the air around the missile to, again, deviate its flight control surfaces and send it off course. An actual kinetic kill wouldn't be ne so necessary under those circumstances. Gabriela, why does Furious not get an island like Hermes and Eagle when she's converted? We will get into this, but basically there is a lot of random discussions going on. And now is a good time, that question is a good time to launch into this. The 1934 Admiral... Uh, 1934... Sir Arthur John's paper. Now, if any of you aren't sure, yes, that picture on the left of your screen, that ship... <laughs> You are right. It does have, it's one of the ideas for a potential conversion of, um, I think it was of Eagle. And the idea was that she would have island structures on both sides with funnels on both sides. And the aircraft would land and take off through the middle of her. We can... Well, basically, we can all imagine how many pilots would have been lost that way. But that is actually a serious methodology which they spend a lot of time thinking about. And strangely enough, whilst I think that's not kind of practical for a catabar or that kind of operation of aircraft carrier, surprising that you can sort of think about it and you could maybe get it to work with Stovall in the rolling takeoff and landing approach as currently being put forward by the F-35, which is a sort of interesting idea. Now, I would never normally be one to suggest this, but again, we've been talking about aircraft carrier survivability. If you're able to have island structures on both sides of the hull, and you're able to have weaponry on both sides of the hull, that can make things different. There is also the fact that it could be absolutely operationally terrible, and I'm fairly sure if you practice it, the amount of accidents it would get would make it very, very unset logical to do. But, said, it's an option to think about. Now, on the other side is a seaplane carrier. Yes, they were useful. And they were quite incredible. They were quite important. That particular sea lane carry is known as the Ark Royal. Later on the Pegasus. Um, TH, the British aircraft carrier will come to Japan in 2020. Do you know the Japanese aircraft carriers is moving cargo? Um, yep. Thomas, when you post that earlier, all I had in my head was no, no, no. No, it's reality. It's actually what they're thinking about. With all those cables, it's a bonus <laughs> winter. Yeah. Honestly, I think it's a good idea for a crash show. Um, Q 
Tro uh, Troco 1388. When the UK offered to sell our anti Conkren back to Ego Chile, was just to get rid of a ship or trying to restart the South American naval race to sell ships? A bit of both. Come on, it would. You see, the advantages of getting rid of a ship was because if you see the treaty system potentially coming up from, if you get rid of Eagle, you can build another ship yourself. This is the point. If you can get rid of a ship, you can build another one. It's brilliant. Come on, re planes. When was the seaplane flying boat versus dry planes carry a contest decided? Um, rather late 1920s? Late 1930s, really. If you consider the Japanese are still playing, building seaplane fighters right through World War II, uh, seaplanes are still being used in certain areas, especially for reconnaissance. So carriers and land planes are best for what they do. But guess what? Some of the carriers carry seaplanes because they're useful for doing pilot recovery. You often have a walrus on a car on an aircraft carrier. In fact, most of the um, think of most of the British air um, British aircraft carriers, they end up with a one or two walrus aboard, literally for that search and rescue. So, it's a. Uh, Half a dozen, one and six of the other scenario. Really, I would argue the seaplane gets to, uh, gets taken out of frontline service by the helicopter. In Carl, the Mizzen sail on the Ark Royal looks innovative. <laughs> oh. Good evening, Bellinora. Uh, Samuel Thompson, allied. Considering Devastators at Midway were doomed, they would have better have been employed as kamikazes. Um, no. No. And yes, I know the Devastators were doomed, but this is the thing is, uh, the interesting thing is, the British pre-World War II decide that their fighters are never going to be able to operate in enough numbers forward with their torpedo bombers for their torpedo bombers to have a safe strike if there's air enemy aircraft present. So they go for a night attack option. And that's one of the reasons why that's one of the logic which goes into the whole developing of the night war night flying for the whole force. The Americans are focused on doing the Alpha Strike, the huge strike option. In which case, they're not leaving any fighters back on the carriers. They're basically supposed to take everything. They do start leaving fighters back on the carriers, but they have, some of the original ideas are they will take everything with them. It's, you know, and in the case is, unfortunately, Devastators, when they attack, don't have the fighter cover. Without any fighter cover, the predictable happens. This is from 1934. This is from the President's Address. General reference to both these treaties, which was made by the First of the Order in the speech in which he presented the naval estimates to the House of Commons on the 12th of March this month, has a vital bearing on the subject. Sir Bolton said, This country has made tremendous reductions in our armaments in trying to bring about a general limitation. People may argue whether what was done, that whether that was done rightly or wrongly, but we have done it, and we are still pursuing that end. We have not given up hope. We are still trying. 
and I think the House will agree with me, that it would be quite impossible, greatly, to extend our cruiser program this year on the eve of the Naval Conference, and on the assumption, and only on the assumption, that the conference is going to break down. And that was said in 1934. Now, to aircraft carriers. The leading navies have adopted the aircraft carrier as a necessary type of warship, and with her older sisters, the capital ship, the cruiser, and the destroyer, the newcomer has been limited by the Washington and London treaties to unit in the unit displacement, in total displacement per navy, and in caliber of the main armament. The development of this new type of warship is an interesting one, and as but little information on this subject is available in the records of the institution, this paper has been prepared. The London Treaty, Part 1, Article 3, defines an aircraft carrier as any surface vessel of war, whatever its displacement, designed for the specific and exclusive purpose of carrying aircraft, and so constructed that aircraft can be launched there from and landed thereon. By the Washington Treaty, the sand displacement must not exceed 27,000 tons, and the caliber of gun must not exceed 8 inches. By the terms of the same treaty, the British Empire and the United States may each have a total tonnage of carriers of 135,000 tons. Now, here's the thing. Divide 135,000 by 27,000 tons. You will notice that that reaches 5. So basically, the idea was that Britain and America could each have five, five full-sized aircraft carriers. Which is great for America, not so great for Britain. I have to say this is one of the limitations, but the British are of course planning on building uh, slightly smaller aircraft carriers to get more of them again. Japan, 81,000 tons. Now divide that by 27,000 tons, you get three. So Japan's allowed three aircraft carriers. And France and Italy are allowed 60,000 tons each, so two, and they'll have 6,000 tons left over they can't do anything with. By the definition, those vessels that which were fitted out during the war and arranged so that the aircraft could be flown off but not landed on are now termed seaplane carriers. Since the aircraft that you used must be of that description, the Albatross of the Royal Australian Navy and Commandant Teste of the French Navy are the last, latest examples of this type. Their tonnage is not included in that, uh, in that allowed by the Washington Treaty. By Article 8, Chapter 1 of the Washington Treaty, all aircraft carry tonnage existence or building from November 12th to 1921 is considered experimental and can be replaced within the total tonnage limit without regard to age. The Argus, Hermes, Eagle and Furious of the British Empire the Langley of the USA, and the Hosho of Japan fall within this category. Isn't that lovely? Now, let's have a look at his big picture. This is a particularly cool one. And this shows the aircraft carriers of the time. And you'll notice that actually those with islands are, to an extent, outnumbered by those without. Because I don't know about you, but I count two, four, six, seven with island, without islands, and two, four, six with islands. It doesn't. We were thinking seaplane fighters won last World War II, and Americans had Kovar Sidvard. Britain had one as well, the uh, Row. Saunders Row, they were looking at. Let's see. 
Well, no, I feel crew. I believe my topic passed the vote again this month. You will be getting to that, but I think so, yes. Uh, no ship is unsinkable. A few missiles and off it goes, your BB, regardless of armor on it. Mm. Wilcox, total war depends more on industrial capacity and resources and manpower than it does on any particular we uh, weapon or arms supply. I'd say total war depends upon logistics. It doesn't matter how much equipment you have. If you can't have it where you need it, it ain't going to work. Force A1. The only problem with metal, uh, metal cooled reactors is the fact. Oh, that's good. And there's a nuclear reactor stuff going on. <laughs> Jeff here. Found the reference. Twin Islands proposed in 1912 by Beanmore as an aircraft parent ship. Yeah. yeah I wish it had. I, I, I wish the Twin Island ship had stayed in 1912. Jeff, I wish it had, but it, it carries on. Race car meerkat. Military history not visualized has a video of a kamikaze attacks giving fewer casualties than regular attacks. Uh, I haven't seen that. Hmm. Also interesting stuff going on. Let's see. Uh, went towards the issue of supplies of strategic materials. Hmm. John South, and then concentrated. So, John South, you enjoyed listening to this thing, and this, and I'm playing a game of HO. Bought HOI four, and everyone is upset as the UK. I, as as the UK, I had built twenty life aircraft carriers based on Hermes by nineteen thirty nine. Then concentrated the big aircraft carriers in the strike force and battle cruisers. So much crying in Discord as every one of the RN cruiser groups has its own Hermes. <laughs> Would mean fun if the treaties had allowed that. Let's see. Did it? Did it? Did it? But do you need? Do you need more than one island? Not really. No. Argus had a retractable bridge. I do not call that an island structure. They did have a retractable bridge, but that's not an island structure. Hmm. <laughs> In car, were glorious and courageous basically identical when we build as carriers? Well, we'll be able to get into that, but honestly, not as identical as we'd have probably hoped. Don't find out. Everybody forgets that morale is also very important in waging a war. I mean, imagine German morale collapsing outside Moscow in 1941. Yes, but there again, most morale collapses outside Moscow. It's freezing cold in the winter there. I mean, absolutely freezing. If you haven't captured the city by winter, your morale does tend to collapse. Hmm. Interwar carriers. When I can put guns on my carriage to deal with destroyers. Oh, yes. Burn looks okay on paper. That's about the only place Burn does look okay. Jeff Bielan. Check David Hobbs. He doesn't name names, but said the flush deck was for aerodynamic purposes. Eventually, larger aircraft, which did not have hangar, which he did not have hangar space for. Um... Flush deck does help in terms of for aerodynamic purposes because the island, and we will get into this discussion in a second, is something which develops about because of necessity for operational reasons rather than uh, operation of aircraft reasons. However, 
And I say this with a lot of love. There, it gets a lot more complicated than simply one versus the other. It's there are lots of arguments both ways, and we will get into this. Hmm. Nebila, Kaga Akagi, Lexington, and Saratoga. Remind me of the Battlestar Pegasus. Mm. Sometimes the ships travel across a flat plane. Every foot vertical means a wider horizon. Don't see why a CV would be uh, the only ship not to have a tripod mast island. Additionally, you can raise the exhaust. Uncocks, craft a flight deck that acts as a funnel for wind over the bow. I'm going to slide the plane into the wind and let, and let it go. Hmm. That's, to an extent, what they do, start shaping things up. And that's why you start to get round downs. Have a look at these hulls, and you'll notice that some of them have quite obvious round downs, both at the stern as well as at the front. Some of them have sloping. Some of them actually have flight decks, which are not level the whole way across. In that quite a few of the flight decks in the interwar period have a bump and then go up to sort of a higher level for the forward section. Rapid Razor, speaking of guns on carriers, other than a smart, did they ever use their guns? Uh, HMS Formidable at Matapan, HMS Unicorn in the Korean War. I think HMS Ark Royal has a tit for tat exchange or something at some point. Yeah, I'm fairly sure Illustrious gets her guns in um, on something. And I'm trying to remember. Mm. No, I, I, I can't remember any others, but I'm full of, I think there were a couple. She didn't want on. I noticed the Russians aren't on any naval treaty. Explains how they count with battleship aircraft carrier hybrid. That looks crazy. Yeah, they were invited, but no one ever expected them to really turn up. Ian Carr, Iron spent a lot of effort on making their arms air and a mic on our, uh, our crawl our ships. Oh, yes, they did. Mm. Trollco 1388. Naval treaties did allow for hybrid carriers. No, they didn't. We'll get into that. A new house S. Did Glorious manage to get any shots off um, Scar Horse and out? Nope. She didn't. So, there you go. Let's look at the tonnages. You have Argus, Hermes, Eagle, Furious, Courageous, Glorious, all given out and listed up there in 1934. Their date of completion, their length, their displacement. Argus is 14,450 uh, 14, tons. Hermes. 10,850 tons. Eagle, 22,600 tons. Furious, 22,450 tons. Courageous and Glorious, 22,500 tons. Interestingly enough, let's consider the tonnage is relatively similar between Eagle, Furious, Courageous, and Glorious, but Eagle can accommodate 21 aircraft. Furious, 35. Courageous and Glorious, 50-odd. That's a big difference. Then we go down to the Langley. 11,500 tons, but can take 30 aircraft. Saratoga, 33,000 tons, 90 aircraft. Lexington, 
33,000 uh, 33, tons. 80 aircraft. Actually, no, Saratoga was also 80. Sorry. Me better reading bad handwriting notes. I should try and read it from the screen. Ranger. 13,800 tons and 76 aircraft. Japan, the Hosho, 7,470 tons. 26 aircraft. Akagi, 26,900 tons. 50 aircraft. Akaga, 26,900 tons. 60 aircraft. Ryu, no aircraft listed. And number one and number two are both listed as being 10,000 tons. Then you have the Burn, which has... 40 aircraft and is technically 22,000 tons. Now, <laughs> same time, did the RN ever design a carrier around multiple squadrons of Blackburn Black Run? Ah, uh, no, they didn't. Now, interesting. This is what's written in nineteen thirty four. Eight of the carriers are of the island type, with the funnels, mast, navigating position deck on the starboard side of the flight deck. The remaining seven have the flush or clear type of flight deck. The United States Ranger, designed with flush flight deck, has been altered to the island type during construction. In the flush deck carrier, the disposal of the boiler smoke and gases so that they shall not inconvenience pilots about to land on is a problem with whose solution is indicated on some of the silhouettes. Argus and Furious have uh, horizontal ducts on either side, immediately after under the flight deck, and extending almost to the stern, where they are bent downwards, the contents being forcibly directed to the sea, where they are in great part condensed or deposited. Kaga has similar ducts, but the outlets higher. Hosho's three funnels, which project above the flight deck when upright, are hinged, then are turned outboard and horizontal when flying operations are in progress. The two much smaller funnels of Langley are stated to be lit fitted similarly. Akaki has a single funnel on the starboard side, horizontal and transverse with the outer end turned down, whilst Ryuji's two funnels are transverse and horizontal. The trend towards of design is to the island type of carrier. Experience having shown that if the obstacle is short, relatively narrow and streamlined, there is little or no interference with the air currents over the after portion of the flight deck. If a small carrier such as Ryuju, where the length is shorter and the breadth of the flight deck is apparently less than in the larger vessels, the relatively large breadth of an island may cause more serious interference. The island's arrangement is generally lighter and allows for a wider, uh, wider and cooler hangar, and increased stowage of aircraft. It has the disadvantage of making the ship arrangements in the vicinity unsymmetrical, tending to make navigation at times a little difficult and introducing a healing moment which is of some concern to the ship's officers in maintaining the ship upright. In the Glorious and Courageous, this lack of symmetry is represented by 14,000 foot tons. But in Lexington, Saratoga, where the four twin 8-inch guns are 
in the same fore and aft line as the island, this one must be far greater and more troublesome. The spacement range between the 7,100 tons of Yuja and the 33,000 tons of Lexington and Saratoga, both limits being consequent on the decisions arrived at by the Washington Conference. The USA, with an equal ton and agree, an agreed tonnage of 135,000 tons, had a complete had on completion of Lexington and Saratoga 69,000 tons to spare, and decided to build five carriers of 13,800 tons each, of which Ranger was the first. The York Towns and Enterprise ordered last August, are 20,000 tons each, and presumably, many authorities consider carriers of this tonnage as are superior to those of 13,800 tons. Giving evidence before the Navy Committee of Congress in 1929, the late Admiral Moffat stated that the opinion amongst naval officers was that 13,800 tons was the ideal displacement for an aircraft carrier. That was in 1929. Japan, on completion of Kage and Kagi, had 27,200 tons available, and are using this in the Eurasia of 7,100 tons and two others of 10,000 tons each. It is idle to speculate on the tonnage of the individual carriers, which would have been built in the absence of the Washington Agreement, but it is almost certain that the present disparity of nearly 20,000 tons between the placement of the largest and smaller carriers of both the American and Japanese navies would have been avoided and a more uniform tonnage of probably between 16 and 22,000 tons adopted. At Geneva, the British Empire suggested the maximum unit tonnage should be 22,000 tons in place of 27,000 tons of the Washington Treaty, with a total of 110,000 tons in place of 135,000 tons. Again, same five aircraft carriers presented by the lovely politicians. Omitting the oldest carriers, the speeds in the table vary between 23 and 34 knots. But here again, the converted ships had the power and speed given them for their design purpose. For those originally designed as aircraft carriers, Hermes, Husha, and Rijo are 25 knots, Ranger 29 and a half knots. Uh, whilst Yorktown and Enterprise are reported to be designated for a speed approaching that of Lexington and Saratoga. Speed is determined by tactical considerations, but as for aircraft operations, the carrier may have to steam into the wind. She will at times be on a different course from that of the fleet, of which she forms a unit. In order to keep station, she must be generally of a greater speed than the other units. Frequent alterations of speed are therefore necessary, and the propelling machinery must be robust and flexible. It's a good, it's a very interesting paper. And honestly, I will be doing more work on this paper as time goes on. <laughs> Rilja. How did you pronounce Rilja? Rilja. <clears throat> Night Heron Productions. Did the Courageous and Glorious have their armor removed? Uh, not really. They didn't have much to begin with. Honestly. Uh, John South. How much the aircraft carrier numbers is due to the difference in the way the RN and US encountered aircraft, as the RN didn't have permanent deck parks, but can operate them if needed? Uh, that also did affect, plus the Americans included in their aircraft numbers, aircraft which were currently suspended from the ceiling without their wings attached. Of the hangar. Um, that, that caused an interesting thing as well. Eric Kaufman, a 20,000 ton CV blog on his mind. So small. I mean, yes, the planes are small, but still, I need room to work. There was silence and frozen for a bit. I'm not sure why. Many <laughs> signals. Wonder if Clark knows he was silent for a minute or two. Um, honestly, I don't know. I was silent. I didn't hit mute. <sighs> it wasn't. They originally designed as large car light cruisers for inshore bombardments on the enemy coast. Hence, almost no original armor. Yeah, that's the courageous and glorious. Not of you. My view of Manowar show isn't something massively armored, but massively armed, both offensively and defensively. That sounds more like a battle cruiser or a cruiser of some kind. I would say, uh, Jeff Beeler, after Eagle, the armored carriers are the first armored car carriers with real useful islands. I would say Ark Royal has a real useful island.
JP, how does the development of organization of carrier groups in contrast between the various navies in the 20s and 30s, i.e. who had squadron leaders first? The US went squadron first, then the, then the Japanese developed their system, and then the Brits get their system. Although, interesting enough, the Brits are technically operating... Okay, so British aircraft are technically ordered into organized into flights. But the Royal Navy and the Fleet Air Arm has a way of getting rid of around this air ministry rule in that they are, they um, certain flight leaders are senior flight leaders. And as the senior flight leader, they coordinate multiple flights, i.e. they are squadron commanders. So technically, you don't have squadron structure, but de facto you do have a sort of squadron structure. So, so, Scott, with the scale of growth of naval vessels overall, aren't modern Queen Queen equivalent to of a twenty two thousand ton enterprise of the thirties? I would argue they're more equivalent to the thirty three thousand ton Saratogas. That's what I'd sort of be going on uh, going for, really. The Japanese fought Unicorn with super ship, which makes me giggle. Well, the Japanese fought the British were lying about HMS Unicorn in many, many ways. They just didn't realize the way that we were lying. They thought we were hiding a carrier when actually what we were hiding was a logistics line. Which was going to make every carrier more successful. Um, that's better. Ninety half a one. What would happen if Canada entered the CV race? Uh, that would have counted to Britain's total the Commonwealth tonnage in the nineteen twenties and thirties. If Canada entered it today. Could be interesting, but they would they need carriers for both sides. John South, UK carriers certainly carry nukes and UK free fall nuclear bomb with sixteen inch diameters. Making the best sixteen inch shells ever ever made. Uh hmm. listen to bilge pumps which came out yesterday. You'll hear from a person who was involved in applying those things. Uh sometimes on. Since large drones are kind of an unmanned fixed-wing rotary aircraft that can fly from anything, will all warships begin to carry them? They're so useful. Uh, I have a feeling once they get big enough, they're going to be what are a play... I, I think... Well, let's put it this way. The X-47 and other things are what you're going to see flying off... Something developed from that is what you're going to see flying off carriers soon. That's the trouble. Drones, to make them useful, become almost as big as manned aircraft. And actually, they'll probably at some point become bigger than some than manned single-seater aircraft because, than crude single-seater aircraft, because you'll be taking that space and going, ooh, what, what, what more stuff can we check in? More fuel, more weapons. If you want a good, interesting story, look up the Miles M20. Miles M20. Uh, that was an interesting aircraft, which was almost could have been. And gives a good idea of where I think 10% mm, drones could be heading. Right, right, so do you think the Japanese tendency need to pair specific squadrons with specific ships was as uh, silly as it sounds? Um, no, it makes sense to an extent. The British did the same. British have squadrons which, to an extent, tend to operate with the same ship for years, and then it goes into refit, and those squadrons move to another ship. So pairing them with specific ship permanently probably seems a bit silly. Pairing them long term to get them used to operating ships so they are so that the ship's crew and everyone operates well together, that makes sense. Ian Carr, how effective could Glorious and Courageous have been if they survived long into World War II? They'd have been useful. It would have been useful. Let's be honest. If you'd had Glorious and Courageous into World War II, you would have probably had those take on the Atlantic carrier role 
to allow the more fighty carriers that are going to deal with uh, to focus more on the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. So if you have Courageous and Glorious, it's not a case of how effective they as individual ships would be. It's are they effective enough to do the Atlantic job? If they are, boom, they free up aircraft carriers to go uh, from uh, the more newer aircraft carriers to go elsewhere. So that's the thing. You suddenly end up with aircraft carriers with force uh, with force Z having aircraft carriers with maybe more aircraft carriers deployed in the ocean as part of Admiral Somerville's force. So he has a stronger strike for Operation C. There's all sorts of things. It, 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 this is going to sound terrible, but the individual capabilities of a ship matter less in terms of the strategy, a strategic or a strategic thing of fighting a whole a world war or something like a world war versus the value of that ship in taking in filling a role or a mission which needs to be done and freeing up perhaps a more modern more useful ship to go and do another mission yes that newer better ship could do that role better but this ship can do it well enough to free that up to go do the job i need uh, the other job i'd like done which were only can be done by a newer ship Sixteen forty. Sixteen forty. What about a hidden logistics line, unicorn? Yes. Well, some of the reports I've read, and I haven't yet read the Japanese documents because I don't speak Japanese, but I have a friend who I'm going to who's agreed to read them, some of them for me. Um, some of the reports I've read suggest the Japanese thought unicorn was actually a super carrier that Britain was building something which was far larger than actually was. Where uh, then they thought the reason the British were building Unicorn was because it was going to be this supercarrier. But some of the, but the thing is, as we all know, as I've discussed this so many times, Unicorn's actual secret isn't that she herself is a supercarrier. It's that she's a template for a, a carrier which can be a design which can be rapidly produced, and she is there to free up and support all the other carriers in the Royal Navy to make them far more powerful. So she's a force enabler, which gives the equivalent capability of a supercarrier, not a supercarrier herself. So you have the Japanese perception is the British must be building something like we're building with our battleships. They must be building a hidden supercarrier. Whereas the British perception is, well, do we, we don't need a supercarrier. What we need is something to make all our ships work better. And Fia, Ark Royal was needed and extended our expand island by the end of World War II due to radar command and aircraft, aircraft direction needs. When lost, Sheffield was handling radar and fighter direction and renowned command. Um, Sheffield was handling radar and fire direction because Sheffield had newer, better radars. Not that Ark Royals were bad or that she didn't have space for them, just Sheffield had the better ones by a long way because their radar had moved on that much quickly. And Renown was command because, let's be honest, we're commanding from a battleship. That's the tradition. No battleship and aircraft carrier has good space for command. Just ask Philip Vian in at the end of World War II in the Pacific Fleet in the carrier in command of all the carrier battle groups. Rapid Race back. The Drone Mafia will get you. Mm, I doubt it. Jeff Hill, did the marked differences between iron and carriers lead to air crews specializing in a specific ship? No. In fact, it led to the British car air, cr air crews having to be very good on different ships. I was asking, what's the idea with those two catapult dongs on air arc roll? Landing deck, bow section? Why not just have a flush straight deck? Simply put, it gives you more space for your catapult to run. Rapid respect, if Unicorn was so awesome, why didn't anyone else do it? Because they didn't necessarily need to do it. Britain needed to do it because we were planning on operating a fleet the other side of the world from Britain. 
So where is the British industrial base in the Atlantic in Britain? Where is it preparing to fight a war in the Pacific? To get to the Pacific, you either have to go through the South Atlantic into the Pacific that way around South America or through the Panama Canal and across the Pacific to get to the Far East. Or you have to go through the Mediterranean, Suez Canal, Indian Ocean, or down around South Africa, uh, down around Africa, through the Indian Ocean. In there. You have to go so much further. So that's why the British were building Unicorn, okay? It's basically the British are the only ones who have that particular problem. The others don't. Was Shinano conceived as a supersized unicorn? Uh, I think Shinano was conceived as actually the unicorn equivalent of what they thought a unicorn was going to be. Yeah, sort of similar to Indomitable, though. And Indefacable. Night Heron Fraction. Would the Maltas have been considered super carriers in the 44 45 period? Probably by that point, if they'd been built. Hmm. Nothing happy one. Okay, different question about Canada. Once treaties died off late night thirties, if Canada had ordered again gotten again, say half number of UK had and placed half on each case, how different would it make World War Two be? You could have had a very interesting scenario post Pearl Harbor. Let's just say that. But Commonwealth ships counted towards the treaty limit, are in treaty limits. And seeing as we're talking about treaties now, let's get into this one. And I've deleted, taken out some of the slides from this because this section, because honestly, I want to put them in a video uh, for next week's uh, Long Patrol. And because I think it's better to go through my Long Patrol because. I also saw which video, uh, which uh, things have won the patron vote. So, you know, I want to be careful what I'm going to say. Otherwise, I spoil my whole patron one. The Washington Treaty of 1922. Well, it's rather cool. Total tonnage for aircraft carriers of each of the contracting powers shall not exceed... In standard placement for the United States, 135,000 tons. For the British Empire, 135,000 tons. To Fran uh, for, uh, France, 60,000 tons. For Italy, 60,000 tons. For Japan, 81,000 tons. So Japan's being tucked on last there. And this is in the actually copied from the text of the treaty, but is actually getting the third amount. So that's a bit insulting. But if you look through. They have all the rules that they can't carry more than an eight-inch gun, um, what they can do in certain tonnages, and then you compare that to 1930. No aircraft carrier of 10,000 tons or less standard displacement mounting a gun above 6.1 inch shall be acquired or constructed by or for any of the high contracting powers. Sorry, Eurasia. Two, the fitting of a landing on or flying off platform or deck on a cattle ship cruise or destroyer, provided such vessel was not designed or adapted exclusively as an aircraft carrier, shall not cause any of the vessel so fitted to be charged against or classified in the category of aircraft carriers. So again, you can't hide but you can't hide battleships by claiming they're aircraft carriers. And the expression aircraft carrier includes any surface vessel of war, whatever its displacement, designed for the specific and exclusive purpose of carrying aircraft, and so constructed that aircraft can be launched therefrom and landed thereon. It's fun, naval treaties. They are fun when it comes to aircraft carrier design. They are fun when it comes to a lot of the issues. Which are experienced during World War Two.
And the London Treaty of 1930, I especially see as causing interesting issues because I see the 10,000 ton issue as stopping Britain building escort carriers or cruiser carriers prior to World War II. Because Britain is really looking at those sort of numbers and that sort of tonnage area for that. I also see the 135,000 tons as a big limit on Britain. And I have to admit that whilst I would argue that in terms of cruisers and destroyers, Britain gets what it wants. I would argue that in terms of aircraft carriers, I think, I'm not certain, but I think by about 1936, definitely, British admirals might have been prepared to accept an air a battleship loss to gain an aircraft carrier rather like they did with heavy cruisers for light cruisers and this doesn't mean that they're abandoning the battleship that doesn't not at all but it means that they are honestly looking at their aircraft carrier coverage and going we need more of these because they're looking at the air threat they're looking at the developments going on. They're looking at what they understand as likely strike capabilities are, and they see them coming. And in many ways, what happens in 19, after 1936, the gradual breakdown of the naval treaties, so that by 1938, you basically have no one taking a freaking blind bit of notice of anyone what they're building, means that you've seen that coming. And it, that, it doesn't matter. The RN are building the aircraft carriers. The RN are building the battleships. The RN are building the cruisers. And they're not worrying about the tonnage limitations. Um, Jeff Hitler, did the USN want to convert more than two battle cruisers and settle the two? Uh, they, were, they only had two to convert, so that's what they went with. Why did they give carriers to Vian? I think they would have been given him the battles and darings and turned him loose. The darings weren't available by the end, at the end of World War II. The battles were only just coming in at the end of World War II. And so they gave him the aircraft carriers because he was also very experienced at running aircraft carriers by this point and a fleet air arm. And he's a hard taskmaster, but he's a very capable taskmaster. And he's one of the few who can actually drive the fleet air arm crews to really, really go to maximum levels. Doesn't make him popular, but the trouble is the admirals who are popular with the fleet air arm are few and far between. And mostly by this point, either dead, retired, or very, very ill. So they give it to me in. In car, London 1930, nothing to stop for building a far seaplane carriers. Nope. JSL, what plans did Italy have for aircraft carriers since they were included in the treaty? Uh, they had plans, but they didn't really ever push them forward. They get the tonnage because they want the same tonnage as France, but neither them nor France really pushes forward with anything. I want a book written about the guy whose sole mission in life was to get around the treaties. Oh, well, that's... Honestly, that could be this discussion. Literally, the discussions in this book. Um, so Eustace Denacourt, Captain H.S. Howard, USN, uh, Cave Brown Cave, um, uh, Mr. J.H. Nuff, Mr. H. E. Wimper Wimpers, Mr. H. G. Williams, Sir Arthur Johns, Sir Archibald Denny, pretty much is entirely it.
I did love this point at the end. Captain B uh, Boothby suggests the use of airships as aircraft carriers and urges the replacement of the present carriers by airships. He estimates an airship could carry six aircraft and that the present require personnel required would be considerably less than for the waterborne carrier. British aircraft carriers can stir about 186 machines. And if Captain Boothby's estimate is correct, the six present vessels will be replaced by 31 airships, a large fleet to house. I cannot imagine that in an exceptionally rough weather, such as was experienced on the spring cruise of the fleet, which he mentioned, airships would be as satisfactory as our waterborne carriers briefly. US naval authorities have experimented with airships as aircraft carriers, but there is no indication on their part of substituting them for the waterborne type. No one in the course of discussion has remarked on the extreme ugliness of the aircraft carrier. <clears throat> the island type has a better profile than a sister with a flush flight deck, but from all the other points of view, there is little to choose between them. These Cinderellas of navies are the uh, Cinderellas of the other, of the navies are also the ugly sisters. That was by Sir Arthur Johns, the person who actually proposed and presented the paper. He's also it, it's a, this is a great discussion. I am a little disappointed at one of the remarks of Captain Howard. It is frequently asked why it is that the number of aircraft the United States carries is greater than the British ones. E.g., the Ranger on 113,800 tons is reported to carry 76 aircraft as compared with 15 Courageous and Glorious, but all these ships are 50 percent greater in tonnage. Judging from the photos of the American carriers, one reason for the difference seemed to be that many aircraft are stowed on the flight deck, whereas in British carriers, the numbers are given are stowed in the hangars. Cat and Howes state this is not so, and I'm a little puzzled as to the explanation. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, that's gone down quite quickly. Matt Fraser, you've put one of my fluffy research assistants flat out to sleep. I'm glad to be of her assistance. Al Bozaski, uh, for the holiness of the Blackburn Blackburn, let China build a barship. I'll eat popcorn watching as it being sunk during a war. That's a bit cruel. Probably a little bit cruel. Uh, Simon Thompson. German CVs in World War II seem far more insane than battleships. Bomb, torpedo, and mine magnets and resource eaters. Um, mm, let's be honest, if any of them try and get the sea, they are going to, they are going to be at num target numero uno. Jeff Allen, the Italian Navy has all joined the new Air Force to provide its technical acumen, leaving none in the Navy to lead its aviation. That is one of the problems the Navy has, that and the fact that they have... They are mainly designed to operate in the Mediterranean, and they have so many air bases around where they're operating. Why uh, justifying an aircraft carrier is often about uh, yeah, often easier to do when you're going to be operating far away from where your air force has a lot of air bases. Right, so, Man is 16 40. Did he suggest filling these 31 with hydrogen too? I think so. Basically, it was another idea of how to get around the treaty system, because there was no air power treaties. There were sea power treaties, but no air power treaties. So I suppose the idea is you'd have... This is what I don't... This is what I often think is quite interesting. If it had been practical, they would have built both. And honestly, you could have used airships as strike extenders. They ho they pop along above the fleet. The aircraft fly up, dock with them from the aircraft carrier, get carried to where they're going to, then strike range, then fly off and strike the enemy, then get come back to the carrier. You could have done that quite interesting. And honestly, that would be rather like... What's the fighter? Uh, do, 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 do. uh Jedi fighter. Uh the Jedi Star Fighter.
the aft sprite, um, Delta Sevens and Delta Six, the Delta Sevens, because they have those docking rings which allow them to do travel through hyperspace and can refuel them. Well, that would mean basically, and they use the Venators as their main launch ship. So that's what you're sort of talking about. You could be using the, could be conceivably using the um, airships for. However, if you're going up against an enemy who has fighters, and eventually once they have radar, that's really not going to be a good idea. Matt Day, if you lost an R-Class in 1936 for a carrier, could you have replaced Iron Duke as the training ship, then rearmed it as soon as war came? Potentially. If rearming an R-Class would have really made you feel any good about it. Troco 1388, why did the French neglect CV so much? Exactly as we just as I just talked about, because most of their things were in range. They weren't building a big Pacific fleet. If they'd been building a big Pacific fleet, they would have been they would have probably wanted more CVs. Because they would have been thinking about fighting war against Japan. But they weren't fighting anything about fighting war against Japan until far too late. There's a whole discussion going on about battleships. What if it was in an alternative universe, if War, War Spike were a carrier, if War Spike were a carrier, there'd be a lot of problems with people. In Carl, did the Dutch ever consider building a CV? No, they were going for a defense force, which is why they were looking at battle cruisers at that time. But honestly, if time had gone on, I wouldn't be surprised if they had to build a CV. So, here you go. Here are some of the carriers of the 1920s. The Flat Tops, Argus and Langley. Now, I rather like these cute little ships, but they are kind of basic. And please note, I shall be using, as my notes for this, Arthur John's paper. So, I have the table open in front of me. Argus, of course, was completed in 1918, had a length of 567 feet, beam of 75 feet, displacement of 14,450 tons, top speed of 20 knots, shaft horsepower of 20,000, and was armed with six 4-inch anti-aircraft guns and could accommodate 15 aircraft. The Langley, in comparison, was completed in 1922 had a length of 542 feet, so was actually, despite that picture, 25 feet shorter. Um, had a beam of 65 feet, so 10 feet narrower. And displacement of 11,500 tons, so almost 3,000 tons lighter. Top speed of 15 knots and a shaft horsepower of 7,150. She carried four 5-inch guns, but Here's the thing, she could accommodate 30 aircraft. And I would argue that increase in aircraft is entirely due to the fact that you can see her funnels. Argus's funnels go for a weird wackadoodle arrangement, which take up a lot of space in the ship. Whereas with Langley, they just kick them out the side. So I think Langley has the smarter decision because of the funnel lines.
Tian Wang, just put it in Discord and discuss it later, perhaps, on the battleships. Um, Lion Axe, I would like to see a Uno all the rest of the hood was a CV. I think that'd be an interesting thing. Well, that was the other interesting things because, again, here is the interesting scenario. If the hood sisters had been further along in construction, the Admiral class, then they would probably have been the British equivalent of Saratoga and Lexington. In fact, the British might well have gone for three of them. They would have been a lot bigger. Even under the British system versus the American system, the odds are they could have accommodated another 20 aircraft. So they'd have been 80. And I wouldn't be surprised at that point. Those would not have been operated quite like Courageous and Glorious would be. I, if you have a carrier that large with that many aircraft, there is no frigging way it's going anywhere without a Fecking escort, excuse the French. Japanese focus on R and USA and puzzles me. One is on the other side of the world, and the other one is on the other side of a very large ocean. Yes, but both have ships practically here, uh, ships based in close proximity to them. Troca, uh, no, Troca 1388. Uh, Warspite only survived because the Kriegsmarine's torpedoes uh, were bad. Sending her into Narvik was utterly uh, simple. Um, sending her into Narvik was a desire to make certain, although I do agree, I don't think it was really necessary. I think there was enough destroyers sent in in the second battle of Narvik that even without Warspite, they could have made the job. And in fact, here's the thing the thing that would have made sense of sending um, Warspite into Narvik is if once she got in there, she had offloaded a whole load of troops. She'd been carrying landing craft, which she could have carried, and immediately offloaded troops. Because I'm sorry, I do not think any German troops would have been deciding to hang around and fight in Narvik no matter how many, if, even though they had outnumbered the British troops coming in, if they'd also had 15-inch guns looking and going, hello. We're here for counter, we're, we're here for counter-battery fire. There is something about a shell whizzing past your face and your net a close proximity to you, which is, I don't know, that wide, that makes you really evaluate what matters in your life. As an infantryman, a shell that wide coming that close to you would really make you think, you know what, I have an urgent appointment and um, I now need to go find out what it is. Sorry, I've got a Jaffa cake torch in my mouth. But no, Langley and Argus are pretty darn cool. And as I said, if you look carefully, you can see the funnel arrangement on Argus, uh, on Argus and you can see the funnel arrangement on Langley. And this, to me, is what really affects the, the amount of aircraft they carry. Hello, Bijan. Nineteen sixteen forty. You make a good point, re RN thirty eight centimeter guns. Mm-hmm. 
Peter Dawson, I thought HMS Warfight uh, fired over hills using his aircraft spot for it, so it wasn't close range. <laughs> there is a certain destroyer which wishes she'd been firing over the hills. She did fire over some hills at, in the later part of the battle, but she did get quite close to Narvik itself. Um, the Germans are sure, as far as I know, didn't even have an 80mm flat gun. 88mm flat gun. Hello, Mitch Lotes. Droker 1388. Had Warspite missed a U-boat, she would have taken a full spread of torpedoes in the fjord. Mm, no. To be fair, that's getting well off topic of the aircraft carrier debate, but there have been lots of videos done on Narvik, and I'm fairly certain War Spite's dirt roll there was quite useful. As I said, though, it could be made more sensitive. Jeffy, the Argus was useful in Model 2 because a hangar and lifts could handle non-folding uh, non wing hurricanes and Spitfires loaded in Malta. Yeah, she had quite large lifts. It was a useful scenario. Not every carrier had as large a lifts. So. Over the hills and far away, Warsport fires at us again today. Yeah. Here are two more carriers. We have Husha and we have Eagle. Now, this is a picture of Eagle in 1931 when she was down in Brazil and had the Prince of Wales aboard because he was doing a tour of. South America, and at the point he was launching off her, becoming one of the first, t uh, not heads of state, but one of the first elected, uh, one of the first, um, how do I put this, members of the royal family to ever launch off an aircraft carrier. And this was in 1931. Now, Hosha uh, was completed in 1922, had a length of 510 feet, so is really short. A uh, beam of 48 feet, so is really narrow. 7,470 ton displacement, so is almost half the displacement of Argus. And a speed of 25 knots, so is actually the fastest of the first generation carriers. And shaft horsepower of 30,000. Four 5.5 inch guns and 26 aircraft. Cute. Right, I'm surprised you haven't brought up paddle boat aircraft carriers. They're special in World War II. US Wolverine forever, though. She is the carrier of my heart on any lake. Inca, Argus, Furious, and USS Wasp are all important in survival Malta. Oh, yeah. Shomak, when I first said Prince of Wales, I thought you meant ship. Nope, I meant the person at this point. Uh, William Cox, anyone know what the funnel bridge was used for on Lexicon? Saratoga didn't have one. We'll get to that in a second. Supposedly, it was supposed to be approved for their protection. But as you can see, that is a very decent island structure. Eagle has a decent island, and I like Eagle. Eagle? was completed in 1924 it was 667 feet long 
a hundred and five feet beam, twenty two thousand six hundred tons, twenty four knots top speed, fifty thousand shaft horsepower, nine six inch guns, and twenty one aircraft. She is, as I would argue, the first generation of proper cruiser carrier. She is a vessel which is designed to operate with the cruisers in a faraway station. She's armed with six inch guns, which is what most light cruisers are armed with. Carrying nine of them. Okay, I, I, I would prefer her to actually be carrying eight in four double mount, uh, double turrets position down on the hull, but I can understand the single uh, the, the single post. And, you know, she's a well-armed sh little ship. John South, Argus was a great escort carrier. I would agree as well. They did well. These are, I would argue, the little carriers become the template for the escort carriers. Michelle's spotting location for the original eight inch guns. Mm -hmm. So, HMS Hermes. This is her visiting Honolulu, Hawaii. And we can all ask why did the Royal Navy send an aircraft carrier to visit Hawaii? Why did the Royal Navy, very peaceful and friendly with the US, send an aircraft carrier to visit Hawaii? Because even the Royal Navy sometimes makes a point to its friends. Hello, we can reach you. This is our Bobby carrier. And it is a Bobby carrier, because Hermes is completed in 1924. She has a length of 600 feet. She has a beam of 70 feet, so she's quite She's the narrowest of the Royal Navy's carriers. She has a displacement of 10,850 tons, a speed of 25 knots, so she's quite fast, though. Uh, 40,000 shaft horsepower, less than, uh, less than Eagle. But she carries six 5.5-inch guns and three 4-inch guns, plus 15 aircraft. So... It's an attempt, I would argue, again, at another cruiser carrier. And there's a reason the British seem to be concentrating on building cruiser carriers at this point. Now, when I'm doing the recorded videos, I'm going to get into all the things about what aircraft carriers were for. But at this point, and then I'll discuss more about the aircraft carriers' careers when I'm doing their profiles. But And break it up probably more on national terms. But the thing is, why is the Royal Navy post World War I concentrating on cruiser carriers over strike carriers? Well, honestly, the strike aircraft aren't available at the moment. They're not really going to make a strike capability. But what the Royal Navy needs is reconnaissance, it needs spotting, and it needs presence around the world. So, those three things, what can it do best to get that best of? The smaller carriers. And that's what they're being built for. John South, as the prince was instrumental in the fall of France, where it, no. A, the prince had no knowledge of the fall of France. He wasn't even a prince by that point. Um, and B, uh, no. He just he wasn't given the information. He didn't have the information to leak in the first place. There's all sorts of rumors going around him. He didn't have any idea. The fall of France was down to the French, who had... Really, really bad command and control systems in place, but that's a completely different topic. But honestly, yeah. Mm. Jeff Hiller, what changed between Furious and her half sisters such that they? I only have 4.7 inch air guns. Why was the 4.7 inch air gun not more used, especially on destroyers? Because the 4.7 inch air gun was really good at one point, it was considered. And then as time went on, they found it wasn't as fast at maneuvering. It wasn't fast. Look, let's put it this way the 4.7 inch air gun was good at the time it was invented for the likely threats it was going to face. But the threats of aircraft change rather quickly. If we go back earlier 
to these pictures. 1917 aircraft versus 1912 and 1910. That was how fast aircraft had moved in less than 10 years. Gone from being those things, which frankly you couldn't pay me enough to get into, to those which I actually would go up in quite happily. I'd want a parachute, but I'd go up in. These to those in less than 10 years. Again, you get the aircraft developments and the aircraft carriers coming along. The thing is, the air group develops faster than the carriers do. Why? Because it takes a lot less time to build aircraft than it does ships at this point. If you're talking about the modern era, I would argue it almost it's almost even out because the development of aircraft and a good aircraft type, because of their complexity, now takes a good 15 years. I would argue, again, a development of a, ship, uh, a good aircraft carrier, if you're doing like Britain and you were building it from scratch, again, takes about 15, it takes about 15 years. An aircraft type will probably be in service for 20 to 30 years. An aircraft carrier will probably be in service for 20 to 30 years. Ah. Inca, Hermes, must have quite a balancing structure to counter that flying bridge. Yeah, let's put it this way, the calculations were balanced. Dr. Clark, here's my question. Where did she go after, and where had she been before Honolulu? Interesting enough, she'd been on the China station, and she had wandered out from the China from China, and she wandered back to that station. So actually, she came to America from the other way, from uh, from what I read about it. So it's a rather cool picture. Christophos, the RN had very good relations with Hawaii from before it became a state. Interesting enough, Britain's poor relations with Hawaii were given as one of the reasons for the Germans being given two weeks, a German ship being given two weeks in um, Hawaii uh, before it was interned, rather than the usual 48 hours. My argument would be because they felt that the Americans were so weak. It was only when Japanese battleships turned up that the Americans actually acted, and so the Honolulu authorities felt they had strong enough to do it. Drunk, uh, Trauma 1388, Tom Sandal. Yeah, why is which is why sending large ships inshore was so dumb in the first place. But the torpedo, uh, had the torpedoes worked, it would have been a massacre. Maybe Churchill does get a blame? Possibly, if anything can be on. But again, I'm not sure if the, torpedo, the torpedoes didn't work, so in the end it doesn't matter. And the thing is, I have a feeling the reason... Sorry about that, but... Uh, the torpedoes didn't work. Hmm. The reason the torpedoes, you know, didn't work is their warhead, their detonators weren't working properly. And as I said before, bringing war spite in makes sense to the extent of having an enforcement asset. You say, what about cruisers? Now, I, I argue that an Arafuser class cruiser would be the far more sensible vessel to send in. I often do that quite happily, but they didn't. They made a decision to send in a battleship and make a statement of commitment to Norway. Vision, did the USN see the carriers a replacement for the battle cruisers of the Lexington class? To an extent, I think they did. I think they honestly saw the battle of the air. They saw the idea was they were building the battle cruisers for speed. And the aircraft, of course, have even greater speed than a battle cruiser. Jeff Peter, why was Tremie's tripod mass so huge? Ooh. Uh, they felt that that would give her good fire control versus a cruiser. Remember, um, I'll say, uh, bombers, did anyone get the bright idea carriers didn't need escort carriers? 
Light bombers, did anyone get the idea? Uh, carriers didn't need escorts. Um, yeah, someone always has the bright idea. When was she in Honolulu? Um, let's see. I have her details for her. Visit to Honolulu. Hermes, Hermes, Hermes. Uh, 1924, roughly 1924. So, literally, she entered service in the beginning of 1924, and by the end of 1924, she's visited Honolulu. A German small cruiser ended up in Honolulu for two weeks before it was interned. Basically, some Japanese battleships or heavy cruisers, I can't remember exactly which, turn up and they decide to intern her rather than risk a fight with the Japanese. Vision, balance well. Since carriers always seem to sink with the island on the upper part of the list as opposed to hitting water first. Good counterweighing. Hmm. Rara Air 4 I swear this channel has one of the few, it was one of the few bright spots of 2020. Thank you. That's very kind. That's why I'm not slamming 2020 so much at the moment, because it has been a lot of fun. I'm just going to continue with a lot of fun into 2021 and onwards, I hope. So, Alan, thank you. I was recently pondering on the same question. Conclusion, modern air power and strategy is also build strategy from nearly post-World War II to early 1950s onwards. Yeah. Jeff Hiller, what plans were there to modernize Herman and Eagles? Uh, they were going to be replaced. That was what Unicorn was for. So, next we have... Furious and Akagi. And I like putting these two next to each other. Because that's Furious in her final form. Furious, date of completion, 1925, 786 feet long, 90 feet beam. So by far the, um, let's be honest, fattest was HMS Eagle with 105 feet. 22,450 tons displacement, 31 knots top speed, 90,000 shaft horsepower, Armed with 10 5.5 inch guns, 3 4 inch guns, and 35 aircraft. In contrast, Akagi, 1927, 763 feet long, 92 feet wide, 26,900 tons in displacement, but a top speed only of 20 and a half, 8 and a half knots. 131,200 shaft horsepower, so there is only two other carriers with more powerful shaft horsepower than her on this on this list. She's armed with 10 8-inch guns and 12 4.7-inch AA guns and is armed with 50 aircraft. Again, if you look at it, Akagi has her funnel canted down and out off the center line. Furious, as we were talking about earlier, has her funnels going round the back. I would argue again, the difference in aircraft numbers between Akagi and Furious, 35 to 50, uh, 50, is largely down to the funnel arrangements. Because you have no idea how much... Uh, how do I put this? Tr trunking the funnel through the freaking hangar takes up so much space. I, there is, that is the single best argument for having a freaking island is to get the smoke up and away from the flight deck and away from the carriers and not having trunking going through the freaking ship. 
because it takes up so much space. It adds so much weight. It adds so much complexity. Oh, and it also bakes your hanger. And I mean, literally, the conversation we were having on Sunday, where we were talking about the heating of the hangers and everyone was going, oh, do they really get really hot? Well, I was going, being honest and going, well, actually, they don't, but they were worried about it. Well, that was technically not quite true, what I was saying there, because there is, it's not the sun which makes them hot, but the trunking of the funnels through them, oh, by gum, that can cook them. Now, this is why, again, on the earlier carriers, they have these door, they have an, a, down, a lower flying off position, like on Furious, and they would open up the doors, if there were doors on that, the whole time. It's occasionally, doors weren't fitted because they'd been removed. And basically keep cool air running through the ship to try and cool down the hangar because of the freaking exhaust fumes. Mm hmm. When was it? Melanie, sixteen forty. When was this interment? I think nineteen fourteen, nineteen fifteen. In car, were there any plans to rebuild glorious and courageous, enclosing the bowels and increasing air capacity? I think there were some plans for that. Um, Nadia, everyone, what, what do you think if Canada would have built CV? What would it look like? Because USA and UK use of both countries' battle cruisers. And designed its own round that idea in a Canadian way. Um, I feeling any Canadian design would have looked like the Royal Navy's ones because they'd use the same core of naval constructors. <laughs> Jeff Hewlett, so no World War Two unicorn is uh, so no World War Two unicorn is off to China to chase pirates, pretty much. Jeff Miller, Furious also pioneers the ski jump lawn for aircraft. You Furious pioneers many things. If you look at Furious, you can actually see there is a bump in her flight deck. You This picture illustrates it quite clear, clearly, if you look at it. If we expand it, you can see. There is a bump in her flight deck, which is designed for airflow in the upper flight deck. And you sit there and go... Do you have any idea how difficult it is to build a ship with a bump in it? It's frankly a feat of engineering. Oh, no, actually, you've got much better at yelling and not having the mic peck. I try and keep more careful use of where this is. Uh, Chris Southgate, would building escorts be better for the current and than the QEs because then there would be a continuing shipbuilding industry rather than the bust followed by all the skilled personnel laid off? Well, Britain is building continuous escorts. That's the whole point of the Type 26 program, the River Class the Type 31s and the Type 32. So that should keep going. And honestly, here is the point. You have, Britain has the aircraft carriers because they give us the capability which very few other navies have and mean that we can throw our weight around a bit more. Because we turn up with the fifth generation aircraft and the aircraft carrier to the party, so we get to have a say in what goes on far more rather than just we're supplying one of the escorts or some of the escorts for the carrier battle group. It means we tend to supply the commanding officer. It helps. But I would agree that the boom and bust strategy is 
pointless. You shouldn't have a boom and bust. You should probably have a shipbuilding strategy and you should have not just the aircraft carriers, you should have a regular flow of heavy ships going through LHDs, aircraft carriers, auxiliaries, all the sorts of specialist ships that you build sort of one-off should be structured so you have them, a constant flow of them coming through to keep the yards busy, uh, keep the yards that sort of produces them busy, but also keep have a constant escort yard uh, production factory as well. That would be the most sensible thing. So you have constant submarine production, you have constant destroyer, um, destroyer or frigate production, and you have constant specialist shipping construction, what we call it, which would be auxiliaries, aircraft carriers, um, o uh, ocean, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the, uh, the oceanographic vessels, the hospital ships, the icebreakers, all the other things the Royal Navy needs. There I come. I've returned with tuna fish, which my research assistant promptly straight away, straight up took away from me, right from my hands. Good fluffy research assistant. You have a rapid race, like, you have deep feelings today. I do. Okay, run. Bolivar, not an expert, but how does the BB ever get to sink a CV if the CV crew is in any way competent? Well, as long as they manage to keep the battleships at range, that's the whole point. The British are always worried about the idea of a battleship getting close enough to its aircraft carriers. And then they go off and do the whole things with Courageous and Glorious, where they're going off on their own with destroyers as escorts, and that's the only thing. Um, and they don't keep up, uh, in the case of one of them, they've not got any aircraft airborne or even ready to get airborne because the commander is being a bit of a silly burger. I don't know. Uh, but as Will and Cox folks, they come close with Taffy Free. If battleships manage to get it, it's a strategic surprise. If I wanted the tribal version of aircraft carrier, where do I look? Um, <laughs> HMS Formidable and HMS Illustrious do a um, fairly good job. Very interesting. The trouble is to keep, it takes two to three years to build a ship which serves for, say, 20 years. So to keep one yard open continuously, you need to build 10 ships before the first one needs replacing. Pretty much. So if you've got a navy which is going to have, I don't know, 24, possibly 30 escorts, and the odds are they will, ser they will usually serve 20 to 30 years. That seems to be one rolling out a year if you can keep it going. And while well, aircraft carriers, they take about three or four years to build, as do the oceanographic research vessels, and then you have the auxiliaries and all the others. And you could keep two yards going. If you were sensible about it. Peter Dawson. Glorious was sunk by a ship, Courageous by a sub. Yes, but Courageous was out with two destroyers playing anti-submarine warfare hunter. That is not an intelligent use of a ship. Of the aircraft of, of Courageous's size. Please. I, I agree. The, poly, the uh, doctrine has been developed with... They're not. The doctrine is developed with Argus. Eagle. Hermes. Very sensible use of them. They are cruiser carriers. If they get sunk, that's not a major loss to your strike or fleet fighting capacity, but it's a very useful size for anti-submarine warfare in this time. That thing and its sisters are big enough they shouldn't be on anti-submarine warfare hunting. Okay? Jeff Peter, how did carrier escort groups evolve from 1919 to 1939? 
uh, by 1939, they usually had a cruiser and a couple of destroyers in capacity in in um, nearby. Don't get, uh, don't get me started on that. Do not get me started on that. And Akagi, I'm not sure if I remember. Uh, I did read out of figures, didn't I? Yes, I did. So now we have Lexington and Saratoga. Aren't they good-looking little ships? You will notice they have some similarities, and they have some differences. And you'll also notice, for comparison, there is Langley! Yay! Langley looks so cute and little next to them. Isn't it cute? Really, I think Langley should be moored between the two of them so they can protect her, because she's their elder sister, but she's very, very tiny. And really, she needs to be between her two younger sisters to protect her really you know with their age guns so really it'd be nicer if langley was instead of being on the outside was in the side between the two of them but she's not as you can see strange enough in harbor these ships do have their aircraft on deck as if they're planning on doing some flying operations which they possibly were you have Lexington at the top, you have Saratoga in the middle, and you have Langley at the bottom. All moored at Punjet Sound in Bremerton, Washington. If you look, Langley is more the main great art. Don't be cruel to Maiden and to Langley. She's lovely. Reparation. It wasn't there any carry action during the peaceful period 1919 to 1939. Basically, the British bombing some pirates. Do you know what that tent in the middle of Saratoga's deck? Well, not Saratoga, but Lexington does look like she's about to do some launching aircraft, and she's the one which has the aircraft actually in position to launch. Jeff <laughs> Pugent Sound. Mm. What was the problem with Akagi's fighter deck? Hmm, not much, but we can get into that in a bit. Right, Calvin Gasman, re-keeping two yards. Actually, take your time and build one escort in two years so you can run three yards and do it uh, and not have to pay overwork hours. Sounds good. Or you could have two or three building in the same yard at the same time. No, 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 kind of like having an older sister, but Bachi being the bigger brother. That's me. Nungox, what are those uh, uh, bride balcony, uh, bridge balconies for on the on the, on the um? Funnels. Yeah. Basically, they're to allow people to go and watch from an alternative command position. Reference, I find your pronunciation of American geographic locations occasionally amusing. Yeah. Anyway. Lexington and Saratoga. <coughs> uh, both completed in 1927. Both 880 feet, 8 feet long. Both have a 106 feet beam, making them the widest aircraft carriers of up to 1934. Both displace 33,000 tons. Both have a top speed of 34 knots. Both have 180,000 shaft horsepower. And both have eight eight inch guns and twelve five inch guns for AA, and both carry eighty aircraft. Mm. 
Okay, right. Well, Captain Steve, were there ever any plans to convert the G3s to carriers? No, they weren't far enough along. <laughs> How they've competed Lex compared to the Lexus and Saratoga? They'd have been about the same size, if not slightly bigger. Probably bigger. <laughs> it is amazing they didn't come with angle decks early. You didn't need them. Until aircraft landing speeds got really, really high, you didn't need them. Mr. Oates, you were going to mention what the funnel bridges were for on Lexington and Saratoga. They were alternative command positions. So basically, if one, if the forward island structure got destroyed, you could command theoretically from the uh, from the after ones. That's how I understand them. Anyway. Eric Kaufman, I've never noticed how the deck curves. Yep. Bisbee, why build escort carriers from oilers and not on the lines of Langley? Because they had more oilers available at that point. Ro Royal Digital, they both also carry two of threes as seen in this picture. Um, as said, they carry eight inch guns. And uh, five inch guns. <laughs> Jeff Healer, courageous and glorious get the converted because they'd already been built. Admirals had been scrapped and G freeze barely laid down. Well, that's the problem. If the admirals hadn't been scrapped by someone seeking to do, I don't know, lay good ground for the treaty, then they would have been converted, probably, and we would have had far better aircraft carriers. <sighs> Stupid fucking politicians keep scrapping stuff before they need to. You don't scrap the stuff before the freaking treaty. Don't do these freaking good intentions. Like This is a show of my good intentions and my good faith as I come to the treaty. I'm scrapping this before we can get there. It takes away something you can give away at the treaty and get something for. Mm. Tmang, why do flat top LHDs not ha uh, not have angled flight decks and ski jumps? I have no idea on the ski jumps, and the angling probably too to wait. Plus, you don't really need them with the F thirty fives and the Harriers. Again, it you have the angled flight deck to deal with the landing speed of the aircraft coming in. Right, I'll be back in a second because I am steadily working my way through my second bottle of the Iron Brew, and they, and, uh, well, at a certain point, one needs to drain it. Right. Ugh. Whoa. Whoa. Ah. Right. Iron classification makes it difficult to keep track of what's up. Time times on. All these huge ba battleship and battlecruiser conversions were a liability under fire due to slow towns. Is that correct? Uh. 
Not really. And let's be honest, they often would go fast enough. Because if you consider, most of the battleship and battle cruisers have been designed for carrying a level of armor. The first thing you'd do is remove quite a lot of that armor. And so, honestly, they were often lighter in their carrier form than they were in their battleship form. So they were a lot faster. So, yes, they didn't have that great a turning circle, but no ship that size has that great a turning circle. What they do have is a lot of speed. And honestly, some do have ski jumps. Yes, mostly the um, Canberra class and the San Juan Carlos class, which they're based on. Uh, Rapper, anyone else want to know why we don't want the good doctor involved in treaty setup? I would get a lot out of treaties. Seriously, it would be a case of, yes, there is. I have all these projects. What are you going to give me to make me give them up? Time I'm finished. The freaking everyone will be paying Britain not to finish them. Even the ones we could never hope to finish. Eric Alfman, Eric Alfman, if anyone knows of Source of Iron Brew in New England, USA, let me know. I have to try. I have to. I don't know how I can get get to try this stuff. Hmm. Uh, Tom, Tom, don't get me started. It's like blowing up all of these old analog communication networks. A lot of experts say no. Now we've got no backup whatsoever, but they don't listen. Yeah! Any RN LHD will have ski ramps fitted. Otherwise, there will be me standing in front of 10 Downing Street with a loud hailer every day. I will literally turn up there every day to stand up and shout at 10 Downing Street until they do it. But as Peter Dawson points out, LHDs are primarily for amphibious assault, which means helicopters, which don't need runways for landing and take off, hence no angle flight decks. It's the, you have the angle flight deck to deal with the flight speed, uh, the, the approach speed. <laughs> <laughs> right then, so Courageous and Kaga. Now, I will point out it is now nearly half past nine. I'm going to be going past half past nine because it is New Year's Eve, but I will not be going up to New Year's Eve at that point because honestly, I want to go down my family. My lovely girlfriend's family have sent a whole box of lovely chocolates for me to eat. I mean, for uh, the family to share. And, um,. I all, in the nicest way, as much as I enjoy chatting with you all at midnight, I would prefer to be on the phone to my girlfriend. So, I will be keeping going, though, for a bit longer, because I know it's 9.30, and I'm, I, I'm reckoning I'll probably, this will probably finish in about 10, 10, quarter past 10, if not, maybe half past 10. Uh, Rafa Reza, wouldn't you need to yell the first Sea Lord instead? No, because the Chancellor and the Prime Minister live on Downing Street. Sam Thompson, did admirals use um, aircraft carriers or battleships as flagship between world wars during joint operations? Battleships. I have to be honest, in terms of space, a battleship is set up for a flag officer. Most of these aircraft carriers aren't. In fact, I would argue the RN doesn't build an aircraft carrier with a flag officer in mind. Till the audacious class. And I would honestly argue you don't get a flat proper flag facilities till you've had the current Queen Elizabeth class. Jeff, uh, Carmen Gasso, please take a look on the Discord in the Bill Transmitting section. I will do in a bit. 
The girlfriend, unfortunately, is not here. She's shielding in her home. I'm, uh, the, she's up in her home, and I'm in my home. So it's phone calls. Courageous. Completed in 1928. 786 feet long, 90 feet beam, displacement 22,500 tons, 30 and a half knots top speed, 90,000 shaft horsepower, 16 4.7 inch guns for AA work, 50 aircraft. Kaga, 1928, 715 feet long, so again, shorter than Courageous or Glorious, 102 feet wide, so fatter. 26,900 tons, so heavier. Same as Akagi. Top speed, uh, 23 knots versus Akagi's uh, 28 and a half knots. But that can be explained because she has only 91,000 shaft horsepower. And she still carries 10, 8 inch and 12, 4.7 inch aircraft uh, guns and has an air group of 60. Mm hmm. And you can also see, look at the freaking great big funnel. I mean, seriously. This is what I'm talking about. Look at that funnel. Imagining that running through your, your hangar. That is the funnel on Kaga. Okay? That is what she has to have fitted. That big cylinder you see running along underneath the flight deck, that is the freaking funnel. Versus Courageous, you have it going up. So, this is the point. Courageous is lighter by 4,400 tons. And yet, she carries only 10 less aircraft. And has a higher top speed. By 7.5 knots. On 1,000 less, sh less shaft horsepower. Has, I would argue, the better gun armament. All thanks to not having that. Samuel Thompson, thank you for the Iron Broom. How was my Christmas? My Christmas was lovely. Thank you. And thank you for the ki uh, kind donation. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Sean Brennan. Carriers weren't regarded as capital ships until World War II, so no command quarters. That's not actually the thing, and th this is the old thing. There is this old idea that you need command quarters in order to be a capital ship. That's not necessarily the case. Ooh. Someone is launching fireworks. Cute. Outside my, uh, outside my house. I was asking, and there is a second funnel on the other side, a true funnel origami. Also, there is empty space after funnel. What a waste of... It just... Yeah, don't get me started on those funnels. Um, but no. Carriers do not... You don't necessarily need command space to be a capital ship. It is help. It does really help with your role, but it doesn't necessarily need to be the case. What you need is the ability to be a capital ship. You're projecting power. And honestly, I would say our aircraft carriers start to achieve it. The reason they don't have capital shit, they don't have command facilities built into them, is often they underestimate just how much airspace they're going to need to command and coordinate flight operations. For example, uh, Lumley Lister is based aboard Illustrious for Taranto. And. There is honestly not enough space for his staff as well as the command staff of the carrier. And they start off by having people double hat. And they realize that doesn't work, so they have to crown them in. And it's literally, it's a. In many ways, it's an underappreciation because they haven't actually had to do it. Because again, exercises only last for a few days. So they give you a snapshot 
but they do not give you a complete picture of what a war operation would be like. It's like when I pointed out with exercises before. In an exercise, you have a limited time, so you tend to f concentrate on the aircraft carriers or the battleships, i.e. taking out the big units, the things which look really good in the exercise if they're lots. In war, you're happy to take out a destroyer. To take out a destroyer is useful, because it all builds up. So that can give you a false idea of what your enemy are going to do. And it's no one's fault, it's just the reality of an exercise. Rabbit she is seven years younger, or at least she is in the picks. Yes. In the picks, Kage is brand new. Um, Courageous is has been in service for seven years. Dogs are fine, luckily. The fluffy research is not so well. Courageous and Glorious' is, uh, turrets were removed as part of their conversion aircraft carrier and later rebuilt for HMS Vanguard. Yes, the main turrets were, unfortunately. Well, fortunately, really. It gives them a space. In a ca in car, Courageous was by sub, Glorious by Sean Olsen. Nice no, 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 no. Yeah. Right. And now we're into the 1930s. Believe it or not, we have been through two, four, six, seven, nine, eleven aircraft carriers in the 1920s. That's not bad. You know, we start talking about things and we go, and then you ask, how many battleships and battle cruisers are built in the 1920s? Remember, there is a lot of history which gets written to sell books. And there is a lot of mileage in repeating a stereotype which is made popular, is a popular cultural myth. There is this popular cultural myth that all the admirals are battleship admirals, and all they're focused in on is being battleship admirals. But the point is that in the 1920s alone, 11 aircraft carriers are built. In the 1930s, more are built. You have Glorious and you have Reurgen. Now, Glorious is exactly the same, apart from 1930. As her sister Courageous, that's uh, 786 feet long, 98, 90 feet wide, 22,500 tons of displacement. Everything else exactly the same. But the Ryoja, aka the Prancing Dragon, and I do love that name, is of course 1933, date of completion, 549 feet long, 61 feet wide. 7,100 displacement tons, 25 knots, and a shaft horsepower of 40,000 with 12 5.1 inch AA guns. Meet the Prancing Dragon. Um. What is that huge thing on the flight deck of Kaga? That's a crane over her flight deck. Mm. Paul Kirchman, I feel like the legacy of Battlecruz is one of those easy examples of those popular cultural myths that exist. Yep. Let's be honest, if Battlecruisers were as terrible as everyone thought, then why did the Royal Navy build Renown, Repulse, and Hood? Let's be honest, the newest, bat newest capital ships the RN had Post World War Two, World War One, were all battle cruisers of varying types, but all battle cruisers. And if the RN had wanted pre the treaties, 
they could have scrapped battle cruisers and kept all the battleships if battle cruisers were that bad. They were useful ships for their time. Uh, Tianwang, better to translate it as dragons prance. Um, probably, but prancing dragons so uh, sounds cool to my mind. Happy New Year, Admiral. Right, then. so next, 1938 babies. We have Ranger and Soryu. Now, these are always nice and nice and cool. And frankly, I do like them. But I have to, of course, now drop my lovely, lovely book because they're now after it. Although Ranger does exist on it, so I will go with Ranger. But sorry, you is not. Now, sorry, you, according to this book, was supposed to be one of the 10,000 ton carriers the IJN were building after Rio. As we all know, Rio Sorio was actually 16,200 tons. Or 19,100 tons in full load rather than standard load. Ranger, as built, was uh, completed in 1934, had 765 feet length, 80 feet beam, 13,800 feet um, tons displacement, top speed of 29 and a half knots, and 53,500 tons in shaft horsepower, and was armed with eight 5-inch guns and 76 aircraft. Sorry, you. Well, she could carry 63 aircraft plus 9 in reserve. She had 152,000 shaft horsepower, was 746 feet long, 69 feet beam, and 24 feet draft. And was armed with 12 dual 5-inch guns and 14 uh, twin, a twin 25mm AA guns. Bud guy 8829 just tuning why did some carriers on a full length main flight decks because they didn't think they needed them at the time and because then you could have a flying off position below which we come directly out of the hangar which would theoretically get your fighters in the air quicker which would allow them to actually operate as air defense Troco 1388 here was sank the battle cruiser concept of Jutland which is why hood was redesigned into a fast bb uh, oh, good. No. Basically, people who propose the fast battleship like to retroactively decide to include Hood in the fast battleships because it makes their argument for them better. But Hood is a battle cruiser. She's on the battle end of the spectrum of the battle cruiser's end, but she's a battle cruiser. You can tell that by her framing. Tin Wang, why do they quote draft and not deck keel height? Draft makes an impact in terms of getting into a harbour. Deck keel height doesn't matter unless there's a low bridge. Right, right, right. the IGN's willingness to ignore treaties amuses me. It does. Then we have Yorktown and Enterprise, who were, according to this, supposed to be 20,000 tons. Let's see, how much did they weigh? I wonder. Yorktown Enterprise. Right then. So Enterprise, total displacement to standard was 19,800 tons. And Yorktown's was about the same in standard. Both were 25,000 tons full load, but by October 1943, 
Enterprise was at 21,000 tons in standard. As built, both had eight single 5-inch guns, four quad 1.1-inch guns, and 24 50 cal machine guns. And they carried 90 aircraft. They had a flight length, length as built of 824 feet, a beam as built of 109 feet, and a draft of 26 feet. And they had 124,000 shaft horsepower and a top speed of 32 and a half knots. So they're good ships. And for our last pairing of the day, before we call this a break at about 10 o'clock-ish, so in about another 17 minutes, we have Ark Royal and Hirnu. I always like comparing these two to each other because I think they're rather cute in comparisons. Uh, Vision. Battlecruisers make great, uh, make a great aircraft carrying uh, escorts, as seen in World War II are in IGN. That they do. Did Japanese ships have nicknames? I'm sure they did. I can't imagine sailors not giving their ships a nickname. So I prefer the argument that the IO class were actually battlecruisers. No, they are definitely battleships. <laughs> Again, framing. <laughs> Go inside. It makes you explain it. it. Explains everything. Framing of a ship's hull tells you if it's a battleship or a cruiser and where it is on the battle cruiser spectrum. Trent McCarthy, what is the difference in framing that separates a battle cruiser, uh, a battleship from a battle cruiser? Right. So, framing adds weight to a ship's hull. It also adds rigidity, but it also makes things a lot, and it makes things a lot more complicated for the ring. It's one of the things you can put in, uh, you can reduce to lighten up a ship to make it better for longer range cruising, easier spaces to maintain it, all those things. On a battleship, you're prioritizing survivability in battle where you're going to be in a long range artillery duel over everything else. So you put in as much framing as you physically can to make the compartments and the overall ship as small as you can to make it as difficult to flood and make it as strong a hull as possible. So i.e. the scenario that happens with HMS Eskimo and other ships where they luckily the explosion doesn't pierce the next frame along so that they basically have a point at which they can set up a watertight bulkhead inside the ship can happen as often as, like, as possible to stop them getting flooded. If you want to build a battle cruiser, you want speed. That means you need to reduce hull weight. You do that by two things. You take down the armor and you take down the amount of framing. It allows you to reduce the weight. Same you're doing to do with a cruiser versus a battleship. So, Ark Royal. And Hiru. Now, Ark Royal is, of course, the RN's strike program. She's built by Camelairds. She is 22,000 tons in standard, 28,000 tons in deep load. She is 800 feet overall in length, 94 feet wide with a draft of 10 27 feet, and she has 102,000 shaft horsepower. Top speed of 30 knots. In a free shaft position, as, as you know, down here I do have a nice profile of her entirely, but if I go into that, I will definitely not finish by 10 o'clock. She's armed with eight twin 4.5-inch guns, four quadruple 2-pounder, or 40 millimeter guns, eight quadruple 50 cal guns. She's designed for 72 aircraft. She usually carries 50 to 60. In 1939 to 1940, this is 26 fairy swordfish, 24 blackburn skewers, 
which basically gives a sort of 50 aircraft and there's basically a strike carrier profile. Uh, 1940 to 41, she has 30 fairy swordfish, 12 blackburn skewers, and 12 fairy fulmars. And by 1941, she has 36 fairy swordfish and 18 fairy fulmars, which gives her an air group of 54. The reason she normally carries 56 air to 60 aircraft in actual is literally because of A, shortage of aircraft numbers, and B, shortage of train crews, but also because the aircraft are growing in size and they need maintenance space. When you're carrying three types of aircraft, i.e. fairy swordfish, skewers, and full miles, that makes life complicated. I do find it interesting that basically they go, right then, we're getting rid of the skewers. We're going to give you six more strike swordfish to cover the strike roll they did, and six more full miles to carrying the fighter a fighter roll they did. Here you in correspondence is only seventeen thousand six hundred metric tons, or in as standard, and twenty thousand five hundred seventy tons in full size. So actually, if you think about it, she is smaller and lighter than Ark Royal. Uh, she's also 746 feet overall. She's 73 feet beam, 25 feet draft, and she's but she has an installed power of 153,000 shaft horsepower, which might explain why she gets 34 knots to Arc Royal's 30 knots. She has six twin, um, so that's 12 in six twin mounts, 127 millimeter Type 89 dual purpose guns, and seven triple and five twin for a total of 31 25 millimeter type 96 AA guns and she can carry 64 aircraft and nine spares which are 21 zeros 18 d3as and 18 b5ns they are cute ships and very capable Tian Wang, uh, Hood, I guess, could have been uh, refitted to make a battleship, but then they get around to it. I don't think they would have done. I think they were quite happy with an aircraft carrier. With uh, the battle cruiser, I mean. And they might have made it slightly more on, but yeah, they had a left one. But Guy 882, was there a reason the US, why US carriers beside Lexington didn't have a hurricane bow to the 1950s? Read that the York Sounds had their hangar catapults on the side. Not sure about the Essex. Uh, pretty much is to do with ship. It's to do with stability and your views on that profile of speed. Seven thousand. Not preserving a single British battleship or battle cruiser was a crime against, I would argue, humanity, right? History rather than humanity. <clears throat> Eric Alvin, wait, where will Wasp and Hornet again? Well, here is the interesting thing. I haven't mentioned Wasp and Hornet because Wasp and Hornet are commissioned in 1940. Well, Wasp is commissioned in 1940 and Hornet's commissioned in 1941. So they're all commissioned after they're commissioned after this period. Okay, where can I hide after Rosa? Yamoto was at the hotel. Mm. Right then. Vision, HMS Sergeant Corps was more like a battle cruiser in its wide open spaces. There is an argument for that one. Um, right. Rapper, I thought Ark Royal was older. Nope, she was brand new at the beginning of World War II. There was an Ark Royal before her who was a seaplane carrier, renamed Pegasus, so that could be called Ark Royal. Jeff Hiller, interesting fact, uh, fact today. In January 1931, the Iron conducted the first carrier versus carrier battle group exercise in the Adriatic. See, Glorious versus Eagle. <coughs> he, that's definitely one of the first. It's the first official carrier versus carrier exercise, and it's done under the auspices of a certain Rear Admiral aircraft carrier called Admiral Henderson. But prior to that, 
as Captain Henderson of an aircraft carrier, um, there had been another one. <laughs> Trekker 1388, was Ark Royal conceived of Far East Service? Ark Royal's role was strike carrier. Ark Royal was the big punch of the Admirals if you had a major fleet force, or she was alternatively the carrier which was going to take out ships in harbour. So basically, the whole idea is you have an air group which is orientated around the strike role. Hence, she her air group is made up of skewers and swordfish. She's for taking out the enemy. Far East Service would have been certainly been an option. Trent uh, McCartney, in terms of just their hull strength, not including the armor, how do Ayers or other World War II era ships compare to modern warship architecture? <sighs> Denser. I would say due to alloys and various other things, modern warships are probably just as strong in terms of hull when they're not built super thin uh, to, to really try and get high speed, and then you have the plates warping in and you can see the frames. But, um, yeah. Vision, I, I think you need to take a drink of Iron Brew. Come on, please check the Discord. I would like to see your face. Okay, I will check Discord, and then I will... To announce the winners of the patron vote. So let's see. Discord. Uh, build pump memes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool one. No, no, let's see. And the winning of today's of the um, January 2021 patron when poll ended was. 19 votes, Royal Navy anti-piracy operations of 1920 to 1930s in the Far East, as suggested by Jeffrey Beeler. Been asking for that a while, so good for you finally getting it through. And Washington's cherry trees, the G3 and N3 class, possibly including how useful they would have been in World War II, as suggested by Bale and Aura. <laughs> 71 votes cast. There is also an interesting point being made and produced by Yogi Khan, which got 14 votes. Interesting enough, um, so there's 19, 15, and 14 for the top three. Well, was what was the strategic thinking behind the Operation AL for the iGen? Why run it in the attack on Midway, as suggested by Yogi Khan? Hmm. I'd like to point out that Battle for New Orleans by Daniel Freeman. The naming of bad uh, for bad karma, the Dutch destroyers destroyed in World War One, uh, World War Two, and the operations of the East Indies Fleet, nineteen forty-five. Um, all got eight and seven votes. So there really was overwhelming support for the three which came top, and the two which won got fifteen and nineteen. So there's clear blue water between number one and number two, but between number two and three, it's very close. Very very close. So, the conclusion of aircraft carriers in the 1920s and 30s? Well. It's a period of construction, and it's got to be something that you can't keep going, nah, you know, they were ignoring it. They were focusing on the battleships. Well, they're actually building aircraft carriers. They're not building battleships. This is the point. The battleships don't get built. Let's, let's look at them. what battleships get built. Nelson and Rodney. Whoopie doodah. The RM built like two battleships. Same time, they build about. Let's see. 
Argus, Hermes, Eagle, Furious, Courageous, Glorious. Then Arcroar comes in. Finally, you have the the Duke of York's being ordered at the same uh, the King George of Hiss being ordered at the same time as the illustrious class. But let's be honest again, the KGVs and Vanguard end of service. That's a few carriers, a few battleships. Well, hey, but in the same time, there's the illustrious class, implacable, indomitable. There is indefatigable as well. There is the light fleets. There's unicorn. There's all sorts of things which come in service. Yeah. Damn, no Shikoku either. They're all commissioned in the 1940s. Many six forty. What a single hood. What caused? What was it that caused the bow wave to be so far aft and uncover the hull red hull plating? Oh, the planing hull design combined with weather conditions. Thank you, Bijan. Bilge Pumps is still to the tenth, and please enter for Bilge Pumps competition. The Bilge Pumps competition is cool. AL was the attack on a the Aleutians invasion, Melanie sixty forty, and that was the other option. And it's quite a cool idea to look at. Um, Represent, was all the carrier construction tr uh, treaty related, or was the sea change underway at that point? I would argue the sea change was underway at that point, because why would they write them into the treaties if they weren't already considering them? <laughs> this is the point. In 1920, you have no idea where aircraft carriers are going, and yet you write in 135,000 tons worth of tonnage. That's a lot. <laughs> I don't know if I believe that was the cause, but I believe there's a picture of Hood after a 1931 refit showing the same phenomenon in speed trials. Pretty much her hull is an interesting construction in the sort of Hood. Actually, it's the interesting thing. I think if they'd taken off the armor and put on the flight deck of a carrier, Hood, uh, the hood design would have actually made a very good carrier, I think, I have this feeling. This is one of the reasons why I'm really annoyed at the getting rid of the Admiral class. The RN could have had three very good aircraft carriers. Instead of furious, curious, uh, courageous, and glorious. And they'd have matched engines with a battle cruiser, which would have probably meant that Hood would have been refitted earlier on. Because it would have been her job to escort the carriers. Which means you have a refitted hood wandering around the world. You also probably don't lose two carriers in 1940. Because, as I said, if they're big enough, why would you let them go off and run free? Rapid Razorback. Yes, but until Pearl Harbor, uh, conventional wisdom, cultural myth still has the carrier as a support ship. Uh, cultural myth has it as being the support ship. Whereas if you consider prior to Pearl Harbor, there'd already been Taranto. There had already been multiple operations in Norway and various other places. As I point out here, the first carrier strike, actually it's easier if I go this way, is, look at this. Tondern, July 1918. 
Sailing for the attack on the Graf Zeppelin sh- German Zeppelin sh- sheds at Pondern, July 1918, sop with camels on the flight deck of HMS Furious. Right then. I am going to say thank you to everyone for being here this evening, and I hope you've enjoyed it. It's now 10 o'clock. I'm going to go off and eat some chocolates and spend some time with my family before the new year cha- changes over to the new year, and also, as I said, home my girlfriend. So I hope you've all had a lovely evening. Thank you again for being here. And I hope to see you again on Sunday. And I hope to see you again in the coming months because lockdown continues in the UK and I'm expecting to continue till July, no matter what they're calling it. It is. It's still pretty much lockdown. And honestly, I'm planning on continuing this now permanently. You know, I, I don't mind whatever happens, even after lockdown. The whole reason I set up the system and put it on the days I have is so I can continue this on. Like Drac, basically. Because I like you all. It's a nice community, and it's nice chatting with people, and it's nice doing this sort of work, for especially for a historian like me who likes wandering around the topics, who likes being able to teach basically one-off lectures, in a way, and also sort of a whole sort of course on naval history. And... Honestly, for a dyslexic academic like me, I can never write enough journal articles that to get out, or enough books to get out what I want. It just takes too long time of editing and making sure they're right. If you consider with dyslexia, combine that with the average typos, and then you do a hundred thousand word book, a hundred thousand word PhD thesis, or anything, you can imagine the amount of time I spend editing. To get it right. There is a reason I'm a workaholic. I spend most of my life going back over my works to look for typos or misspellings. So this sort of thing really, really makes me feel like I'm contributing to my field even more. So thank you. And Happy New Year. Thank you everyone, like I said, for watching. Uh, so Jeff Hiller, how did the hull, hood hull compare to Lexington's? I would argue better for a battle for an aircraft carrier. Greg Sassy, Admiral Carrier 4C? Well, they could have been if they'd had three of them. Um, especially if they survived with Courageous and Glorious. They would have been big enough and still fast enough to be operating with the front line. So they could have been. That's the thing. Courageous and Glorious survive. It's one of the other carriers is sent to 4C. If courageous, if it's a uh, if it's an admiral class, I wouldn't be uh, admiral class rather than courageous and glorious and furious. Then I wouldn't be surprised if you have the admiral classes and sent to four C. And perhaps a modernized hood out there as well as flagship. After all, if she'd be modernized, she might have survived. So take care, Sean Mac, Paul from Chicago. Thank you. Uh, thank you for doing the uh, uh, thank you for doing the administrative job this evening. Good evening and take care, Bijan, Chris Southgate, Carl Gasberg, uh, Melee sixteen oh forty. Thank you very much for being here. Rick Vasa, thank you. Tian Wang, thank you. Silly Manico, thank you. Abzaki, thank you. Eric Kaufman, thank you. Nutty Hyper One, thank you. I have put in all the upcoming brew ships so far. Aviate Enterprise, thank you. Captain Zebra, thank you. Fentmenter, thank you. Jeff Beeler, thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. John Shea, thank you. Happy New Year. Jeff B, happy New Year. Calvin Gasberg, Bug Guy 869, happy New Year. Wish to lie, Dr. Clark. Uh, <laughs> who knows? Hopefully, July 2021. Happy New Year, Belliver. Uh, Cajun, happy New Year. Not Wolf, Juicy Decision, happy New Year. William Bolton, happy New Year. Sean Brennan, happy New Year. Steph Thompson, happy New Year. Abzaski, happy New Year. Jane Wolf, happy New Year. Oh, good Lord. Uh, Thomas Vandal, Happy New Year. That's logic. Regardless of how much opposition, we continue with the fi- uh, fires of passion burning for uh, right in our heart. We always hope to. Uh, take care, everyone. Happy New Year. Gordon Collins, Happy New Year. Thank you, everyone. And JF, Happy New Year. Basically, take care, everyone. Oh, I've got about 70-ish documents and 70, zero finished works because I, uh, I, I suck at editing or turning into something re- readable. Not to mention the rewriting. I know it's so, so depressing. Anyway, Dean Carter, Happy New Year. Thank you, everyone.
And then you have, of course, the fact that the editors sometimes make changes you have to change back because they've changed the entire meaning of it. And then that ends up with a whole lot of debate. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you, everyone, who's liked, who's subscribed, who's just watched the video. Thank you to everyone who's joined Discord or Patreon. Thank you to everyone who's done the Super Chats. You've all been amazing, and thank you. And I will see you next year. In fact, I will see you on, on Sunday. Because I have brewship scheduled for then. So a good start, everyone, to 2021. And thank you for being here.